Sam. All right, good afternoon. Mr. Brennan? Present. Mr. Rickerman? Here. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Present. Mr. Vine? Yes. Mr. Davis? Here. Mayor Benjamin? Present, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, You're Reverend McDowell, would you bless us with a word, please? Yes. Let's buy a hedge. Lord, we pause in the midst of this day and this time to ask your blessings upon those of us who have gathered, gathered in a very virtual way, but gathered together to flesh out and to discuss those issues that are necessary for this city of ours. Lord, we pray that, that you might touch and invigorate each one of us, allowing us to sense your presence and your guidance. We ask it, we claim it in the Creator's name. Amen. 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 Are there any uh, uh, amendments to the agenda as proposed? Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Duval. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move we adopt the agenda with the following amendments. On item 48, add quiet zone and bond court proceedings. Under item 49, uh, defer van robotics. And add item 52, discussion regarding the development of security personnel or devices pursuant to SC code 30-4-70A3 of Nehemiah Action Assembly. And Thank you. The second. Mayor Benjamin. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I did have one additional uh, clarification for the agenda item eight. Um, it'd probably be easier, sir, if I just re read that one. Council is asked to approve contract amendment number one to extend armed security guard services from January 1, 2021 to June 30, 2021 and approve revised hourly rates as requested by the Columbia Police Department, the award to security management of South Carolina LLC, the firm located in Columbia, South Carolina. This clarification, Mayor and Council, is an hourly change from $14.28 per hour to $14.80 per hour or a 58 cent hourly increase with the projected billing for March 2021 when the rate became effective through the end of the fiscal year, June 30 is $24,314 hours. I'm sorry, yes, hours. And that um, billing during that time frame, $14,102.12. This is no cost to the general fund. I'm sorry, the cost to the general fund is $8,896.62, and the cost to the water and sewer fund is $5,205.50. Um, the agenda includes a summary of the funding allocations to date, and this amendment does not require an additional allocation of funding. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, item number 52, Howard, if you would, Repeat that again. Uh, we're adding item 52, and that's discussion regarding the development of security personnel or devices pursuant to SC code 30-4-70A3, the Nehemiah Action Assembly. Is a second to the, uh, uh, Thank the you. adopting the agenda as amended? Second. Question. For the previous question, Clark, call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of? Uh, March 16th and April 6th, 2021. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Um, 
clerk and assistant clerk. Thank you for getting this done so promptly. Move the previous question, clerk, call the roll. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Present. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you, ma'am. Mayor Benjamin and Council, um, just a quick moment of personal privilege to recognize, as I'm sure you would want me to do this, the National Fair Housing Month and National Financial Literacy Month um, being celebrated the month of April, but of course all year long, as you all are so diligent about um, activities in this regard. But the city of Columbia has celebrated the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and continue to support these efforts to end housing discrimination and raise awareness of fair housing rights. And this year, our Office of Community Development partnered with Richland County Community Development and Lexington County Community Development to work together to highlight the Fair Housing Act's seven protected classes, which include color, uh, sex, gender, religion, race, national origin, familial status, and disability. And by so doing, there are various video recordings that um, our citizens and all of the Midlands can take advantage of watching virtually of these seven protected classes and reminding citizens to always contact us if you feel you've been discriminated against in any way um, as you watch these videos on our city's website. As far as National Financial Literacy Month, um, the City of Columbia's Offices of Community Development continued to offer financial education workshops and expanded outreach through the Bank on Columbia programs as well as, and those programs of course offer second chance banking opportunities for our citizens through our partner banks, as well as our Columbia Kids Save program, which focuses on educating our kindergartners at an early age on the importance of savings at, a, at their young age so they carry it with them throughout their lifetime. And so with that, we wanted to recognize those important principles during the month of April and all year long. Uh, it's fantastic. We're so thankful for the work that they do. Um, and couldn't be more important than times like these. So, so thank you uh, to all of our team. Doing great yes. Good awesome work. Yes, sir. Thank you all. With that, we will begin our City Council discussion action items. Item two is our normal COVID-19 update. The Honorable Mayor Stephen K. Benjamin, as well as our Emergency Management Director, Mr. Harry Tinsley, with the situational report. Uh, I'll be brief in that I'm, I'm encouraged, as I'm sure many of you are, with the trends that we've been seeing. We'll, we'll, we'll see a, a, a tick up uh, here or there, but consistently, we're seeing some pretty good um, uh, low rates of infection um, across the state and across the community. And we hope that that maintains over the next uh, several weeks. Um, obviously, um, uh, we, we, we'd love to see a greater adoption rate uh, as, it, as it relates to vaccinations. And, and there's a, a good bit of work going on, many of you on this call, um, leading that charge in the community. And thank you for that. We've got greater, greater penetration. Universal access to the, to the vaccine that does not necessarily translate into equitable access. So we got to keep grinding in, in, the, in, that, in that space and hopefully we'll get all of our vaccination numbers uh, up higher. But I, 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 I am pleased, particularly as I, as I dialogue with colleagues and peers from across the country at, 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 the, at the low rate of infection that, that we're seeing here uh, and, and, and hope it persists over the next, uh, next several weeks. And, um, of course, the Harris will give his report. Uh, Harry, uh, read it every single day. Thank you um, um, uh, for keeping us in the loop and all the numbers that matter. And, um, and thanks to the whole team for the continued, uh, the continued sacrifice. So uh, I'm done. I'm city manager. Thank you, sir. Mayor. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Madam City Manager. Again, thank you for your time. There's some additional information and data dashboarding your uh, reporting your inbox. 
Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I know you have a long agenda today. Uh, so worldwide uh, now, our case count stands at over 142 million uh, global cases of COVID-19. Unfortunately, that leads to uh, that has led to over 3 million uh, deaths globally due to COVID-19. Uh, according to the CDC, as the latest report out here in the U.S., there's over 31 million confirmed cases with uh, 564,292 deaths uh, as of April 19th report out. And here in South Carolina, as of uh, today's report out, total confirmed cases um, is 476,506. Uh, to date, there's been over 7 million tests uh, in our state. The new case counts, uh, as today's report out, additional confirmed cases uh, is 362. That is a 6.2% positivity rate as there were just over 7,700 uh, tests conducted at that report sample. Um, unfortunately, there are two new confirmed deaths, um, and that brings our state total of confirmed deaths due to COVID uh, 8,237. So here in Richland County, um, our case count stands cumulative at 38,303 with today's uh, additional 21 new cases reporting. Uh, unfortunately, there have been now 480 confirmed deaths to date in Richland County. Uh, as of the 14-day report out from April 4th to April 17th, uh, Richland County overall across all zip codes had 1,034 cases. Uh, that's an average, which is significantly down. We continue to see a downward trend, as the mayor uh, indicated. That, that's an average uh, daily of about 73.8 new cases uh, each day. The report out for this period, two zip codes, uh, only two uh, had over 100 cases, and that was the 29223 zip code with 115 cases over that 14-day period, and 29229 with 135. All other zip codes were below 100, just as a sample. So also as the April 14, uh, Richland County's 14-day recent disease activity incident rate is listed, uh, Richland County as medium, uh, as the entire state is, all 46 counties are currently at medium. But Richland County's positivity rate over that 14-day period was 3.8%, which is encouraging to continue in that downward trend. So the statewide uh, recovery rate uh, continues to be estimated at 97.4%. Uh, the state case fatality rate is estimated at 1.73. As stated, the uh, daily case counts continue and they have slowed and have now uh, roughly, are now roughly stable. Um, the state does not anticipate any large fluctuations in case counts over the next uh, few weeks. And hospitalizations, uh, hospital, uh, hospitals still remain uh, stable. They have good uh, capacity. The bed utilization rate is 73.6% statewide, and the ICU bed utilization rate is at 69.9. So that's, that's good news. Um, unfortunately, there are 505 patients currently hospitalized in our state with COVID-19. Um, as noted, uh, the encouraging part, uh, VHEC continues with vaccine distributions with over 3.8 million doses received in our state and 2.7 million, over 2.7 million people have been vaccinated. Uh, here in Richland County, we received over 210,000 doses with 130,000 uh, residents being vaccinated uh, as of the last reporting. And also, as uh, lastly, as, you, as you're aware, the federally supported Community Vaccine Center at Columbia Place Mall has opened and can administer 7,000 doses per week. Um, that will remain open for uh, eight weeks and the hours of operation run from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, as of April 11th, uh, approximately 23.3% of South Carolina's population older than 15 years or older has received um, the vaccination. And according to the CDC's latest reporting as of yesterday, 25.7% um, of the U.S. population have been fully vaccinated and 39.9% have received at least one dose. And those over 18 years uh, of older, 33% of those have been fully vaccinated with over 50% having received at least one dose. And 64.9% of those 65 and older have been fully vaccinated with over 80% having received at least one dose. And that concludes my briefing. Thank you. Thank, thank uh, you. Thank you, Harry. Mr. Duval. Uh, Harry, are we getting any uh, vaccination rates by zip code? 
I have not seen any report on that. I can reach out to our partners and see if we can pull some of that data for us. I think it would be very instructive if we could find uh, where our vaccinations are going. Uh, we consistently see the 29223 and 29229 uh, zip codes as having high incidence of uh, infection. And we need to make sure that we're doing the canvassing out there to get them to the uh, federal center at Columbia Mall. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're going to see more mobile units as well, Howard. Um, uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Devine. Uh, Howard sort of got to jump on me. I was going to mention that um, if you were, number one, this, this report is very good. I, I, it's easy to follow. Um, and, you, and over the pandemic period, you know, when we first started getting these numbers, um, I think you've all recalled it. 29203 was one of those zip codes that was consistently high. And now we're seeing that there is progress. The numbers aren't uh, as, as bold as they were in the past. So that, that does show that we, we're making some progress. And I kind of use 203 and uh, 204 as, as my, uh, my measuring tool. And uh, so that there's progress in those areas and I think that's good you know that's that's one one bit of measuring where we where we are now compared to when we got started uh yes sir I uh, I'm just looking at snapshot data right now at 29203 is the latest report out of 11,248 total vaccine recipients in that zip code but I'll need to look give me a, a moment and I'll, I'll get some information back to y'all collectively on that uh on the breakdown um rates by zip code that's that's good information um harry i just had a couple questions one um so we which is good we're consistently at medium what what is the uh percent positive or what is the rate when uh for us to be at low uh considering uh the cdc guidance at five percent uh positivity rate um would be uh, the matrix now when you look at the 14 day uh, incidence rate, you factor in those three categories, which is the incident rate per 100,000, uh, the trend, and what is the, the trend been in that incident rate, and then what is the percent. So you take the, the, the level of those three, uh, if, if two are, are high and, and one is low, then the overall reading would be high and, and vice versa. Okay. So I, I think we're trending that way. I was just kind of wondering, because I think you said it, we're at 3.8% in Richland County? Uh, that is correct. At the last reporting, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So that would that would potentially put us at low, but we've got to look factor in those other two things. Uh, correct. For the, the incident rate per one hundred thousand and the and the trend in that rate over the last reporting cycles, and both of those are medium. So the, the, the percent positive is low. So those two mediums were classed as medium. We were low at our last uh, meeting, um, but that that rate has been steady at, at medium. Um, and then, the, and this might be information you'd have to get from DHEC, Harry, but um, in, in talking with uh, Prisma Health and others, I know that we are seeing that there are um, people who have gone for their first uh, vaccination and not returned for their second. So in addition to the information that Councilman Duvall requested regarding uh, the vaccinations um, per zip code, if you could maybe see if, if there's a way for them to drill down on um, maybe the percent of folks who are are not coming returning for the second um dosage well so we could just kind of be aware of of maybe what's happening in each zip code and see how we can support their efforts to encourage uh people to go and get their second shot sure will that's good information yep i will i will seek that information and get that back out to you as well so harry the, the questions are harry Yes, the positivity rate is lower primarily because of vaccinations. Uh, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, Councilman, but uh, I would say that it has been based on community spread, which would be the mitigations that we have put in place with the masks, with social distancing, sanitizing, and vaccines would play a part of that if you take the totality of it. I would, I would guess that the data would push you that way. That's just my assumption. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for the great data as usual, um, Director Tinsley. Any other questions for, for Harry? For Harry. All right. Well, let's say um, post. I guess we have the um, the ordinance. The mass ordinance expires next month. Middle of next month. Is that, is that right? No, um, I believe it is. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so we'll have we'll have copious amounts of uh, data to okay. use between now and then. Let's hope and pray these trend lines continue, and um, uh, and we'll, we'll um we'll continue on this quest to save lives and save livelihoods. So, uh, thank y'all. All right. Um, let's keep let's keep it moving. Thank you. Item three is an update on veteran services and housing initiatives given by Secretary William F. Grimsley with the South Carolina Department of Veterans Affairs. Mayor of Grimsley. I believe, mm -hmm. yes. but, I believe but, Mr. Brennan invited him, Mayor, I'm sorry. Oh, please, oh, please uh, if, if you wanna introduce the general, we'll feel free. General, it's good to see you again. Mayor, uh, good to see you, sir. She didn't say the very first Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the, the first ever, ever. Yeah, so couldn't, couldn't have a better better first choice. Um, Councilman? Yeah, fellow Councilman, I, I wanna say thank you for um, uh, inviting uh, General Grimsley to uh, present today. I had the honor to go visit with uh, General Grimsley and his staff uh, a couple months ago to talk about uh, veteran services uh, and the growth of the uh, veteran community here that we are seeing. Uh, in the Midlands area, um, especially here in District 3, we have the Growing Veterans Hospital. Uh, that was a great topic of conversation, and it was great to hear everything the new Department of Veterans Affairs is doing. So, um, General Grimsley, thank you so much for joining us today, and, and look forward to learning about uh, all the wonderful veterans programs you are growing and how we can contribute to that here in the not only the City of Columbia, but the Midlands. Well, thank you, Councilman. I appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, good to see you again. Thank you so much for your leadership. Um, I'm a full-time resident of Beaufort down on the coast, but I'm during the work week, a, a full-time resident here in the great city of Columbia. And uh, so I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a great place to live and work. And, and as the first secretary of veterans affairs, a 33 year army veteran um, and a South Carolinian, this is a great opportunity for a guy like me to try and do the best I can to give back to, I think a, a tremendous group of deserving people, veterans, military members and their families. And of course uh, for a lot, for long, period of time here in Columbia, this has been the home for literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of military members. My dad entered active duty as a young second lieutenant, graduate of the Citadel in 1942 at Fort Jackson. And when he retired in 1975, his retirement parade was at Fort Jackson. And uh, my sister was born at Fort Jackson. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of history here and, and I won't take up a lot of your time. We have, uh, we're trying to continue the service to veterans and their family members as this division now department has been doing for many years and grow a department at the same time. And I came in this job three days uh, before the governor issued his emergency executive order, public health order. So it's been an interesting 13 months. Uh, but as we continue to build them, there are an awful lot of things we have come to some conclusions on. And the first is uh, that we needed a much better outcomes-based and evidence, outcomes-based objectives and then evidence-based practices to really go after the needs of our veterans and their family members over time. And, and I say all that to say that this is really a, a public private partnership opportunity. This is federal, state, uh, county, city and local community, nonprofit, for-profit corporation, veteran service organization, private citizens, you name it. And so we're trying to build this coalition again against these outcomes-based objectives to, and, and using the social determinants of health to really get after the successful veteran population defined as, as individual veterans and their family members who are mentally, socially, uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, familially, uh, financially sound, um, that they are satisfied in the dignified manner in which they're treated, that they're respected by their fellow citizens and that they're proud of their own continued contributions while well, their service and their continuing contrib contributions to South Carolina and the nation. And, and I think if we can establish a success criteria of that and then work our way backward into how we're applying our mission, how we're working against uh, lines of effort to assist veterans and their family members to obtain the benefits to which they're entitled and to really advocate for our, all of our eight active duty installations and then in partnership with our great national guard to, to really work as advocates for the sustainment and growth of our military presence in the state. That's active reserve and guard 
across all six services uh, to really do better and inform and educate the people of South Carolina and our veterans about who we are, what we do, how we do it, and, and what we can bring to the, to the state and strength. And then the biggest one, though, the main line of effort is this notion of integrating the effects of all, of all entities, all groups and people who provide uh, a service to or are interested in veterans. And that's why it's important, I think, that I spend a few minutes with y'all here today, because this is an incredibly military supportive city and part of South Carolina in an incredibly supportive uh, military supportive state. And, and we don't see that in other places. Um, and I've literally lived and served all of the Army brat. So with the exception of my four years in college, I've spent most of my life doing something in a uniform somewhere and moving constantly. So I moved nine times in my first 18 years. I was four years in college and I moved 22 times in 33 years in active duty on my own and about 42 months in combat um, in deployments. And, and so it, it's a great opportunity, as I said, for me to do some introspection and then look backward on how do we take this experience and then transpose it on the 406,000 veterans across the state. And for us here in Columbia, it's, and well, Richland and Lexington County, it's almost 30, I'm sorry, 23,000 veterans between the two counties. I don't have it broken down by within the city limits, but it, it's a very large number. And when you add immediate and extended family on that, this is a big part of the fabric of Columbia and, 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 the, and the community. And, and so there are several things we're working on in this integration phase that, that I think might be of some import and, and that we can certainly always use your leadership and your help. And the first one is our no different than anybody else, maybe our experience that got us here, but we all experience challenges and opportunities in life and, and they're very complicated. And, and with addressing those complications, it takes not just complex risk factors, but unique tailored solutions from a wide variety of capabilities and services to deliver back, to really take advantage of everything that's already resident in the state, to be able to care for this population. And in many cases by care, I mean to the, get to the left side of a problem before it ever gets to a problem. And, and so some of the things we're trying to work on, uh, and I'll start with the great service that we've already got from the city chamber, by the way, Chamber of Commerce, as well as the broader uh, Richland County, and then working with the State Manufacturing Alliance and the State Chamber in veteran employment. So today uh, we sit in COVID at about, well, best numbers we have from the U.S. Department of Labor, between four and a half and 4.7% veteran unemployment today. And that's about 2% up from where we were a year ago, <clears throat> not dissimilar from the rest of society. And so we have been working a series of virtual job fairs to align veterans and their, and their family members, including transitioning service members, into the right kinds of jobs based on the right skill sets. And, and what we have found is that in many cases, we have employers who are looking for veterans who can't find the veterans, and we have inversely have veterans looking for jobs who don't find the right employers. And so what we're trying to do is close that gap. And we have found, and I don't really know how these things work because I've been married to the same woman for 39 years, but it's like a dating app. And, and it has become very interesting and useful where a guy like me, Grimsley, lists his knowledge, skills, and abilities and attributes. Uh, this is my background experience. This is where I want to live. This is where I'm willing to work, kind of my salary range. And prospective employers sign on to the same thing, list theirs. And if you get a 50% or higher match, it automatically generates a phone interview. So we've demonstrated this successfully now in Sumter. We're going to bring one here focused in and around Fort Jackson. It doesn't really matter where you're based because it's virtual. You can do it from anywhere in the state. And we've had a really high initial contact rate success thus far. We're going to do five or six of these over the next year. And we get between five and, well, we had as few as 500. We've had as many as about 2,000 people actually sign on and participate with 40 plus employers at the first one we did in Sumter. And this is really powerful. Uh, yesterday, uh, thanks to Director Adams and Admin, the governor, and, and many others, especially state human resources, we have reinstituted the veteran hiring preference for state employees. So there are 1,300 empty jobs in state government today. Um, and veteran, it doesn't automatically guarantee anything other than if a veteran applies for an empty job, as long as one of, at least one of them, they have to be interviewed for the job, as long as they're qualified. And so this is an opportunity to get some sort of veteran preference and to take advantage of this population and bring them into state government. It's, it's part of building the resilience. Um, and, and then there's a whole host of medical uh, opportunities we're using through telehealth enabled uh, health, both behavioral and physical. We're working some peer-to-peer -peer substance abuse uh, counseling tele enabled. It's a federal grant 
through Deotis using a private partner that we're implementing using nonprofits. I can't get any more complicated than that. But, but it's an awesome opportunity because it's peer to peer and it's veteran uh, addicted people, uh, substance abuse addicted people recovering who are actually providing the counseling. And what we're seeing is a giant sign on, a huge uh, return on this investment because people are now realizing there's lots of places, lots of ways you can come in from the cold there, and there's no wrong door. So it doesn't have to be the US Department of Veterans Affairs, although they have enormously robust capabilities. It could be a nonprofit. It could be another governmental agency, local uh, city, uh, county, or state. Uh, it could be a federal opportunity, but it's really pulling all these together back again, back to this outcomes-based objectives uh, based on measure, quantifiable and qualifiable measure performance and effectiveness. So they're actually grading ourselves over time and we continue to implement this. Uh, you mentioned housing early on, and, and I'll touch on that uh, just briefly. And as I said, I keep an apartment here in downtown Columbia over on Hampton Street. So I'm sort of in the confluence of the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, and the Presbyterian Church. And so a lot of our homeless citizens get meals there, and I see them, and I talk to a bunch of them all the time. And, and, and we do have a homeless challenge, uh, not just general population, but across the state. And depending on whether you use the annual annualized data or what they call the point in time through continuum of care data, and it does vary. Um, roughly in across the veterans of Richland County, which as I said, is about 12 and a half thousand. There are, at least in the point in time count, about 75 homeless veterans in Richland County. That's our best guess. And, and it is unfortunately kind of a swag. Um, but when, and when you look across the state, it's about 450. So Richland County is, is relatively high up there. Um, but there's some interesting statistics and there's some great programs as to, as to how all that comes about. And by the way, and I'll use some state statistics, but I think demographically we can transpose it. Unfortunately, our homeless, pop, our homeless veteran population um, tends to be toward those who are the most disenfranchised, especially racially. So about 55% are African-American, about 10% are women, uh, which I find very interesting. I, I'm a little surprised at this, but our homeless veteran age range, the preponderance over a third are in the, in the 55 to 64 year age group, which is exactly where I sit. We had a long time where the Vietnam population, which is older than that now, uh, was our largest population. The most likely to be homeless though, immediately after service are our younger veterans, the immediate transition out of service post 9-11. And there are a variety of reasons for that. And I'll talk about an additional program uh, we're trying to implement. Give me pages here. Um, about um, about a third of, of our homeless are chronically homeless, like they consistently homeless over three years. They have challenges. They come in and out of shelter. And these are not all unsheltered homeless people, by the way. But but about a about a fifth of them have been homeless for twelve or four months, and again are chronically. And, and about sixty five or sixty six percent, so about two thirds of them are have a disabling condition one way or another. 50% of those disabling have a behavioral or mental health challenge, generally also exacerbated by a substance abuse problem. Um, and then lastly, what I find very interesting about uh, all of this is also about 66% do have a consistent source of income. So it's not that they're completely destitute. Uh, most of them get something from the US Veteran, Department of Veterans Affairs through their own disability compensation. Um, others are getting it through social security, or social security disability, some of them are getting it through um, some other defined benefit, or in some cases, it's a, a divorce settlement. Um, and, and some of them are getting uh, some earned income. So they're not all completely destitute, but it is a big challenge. And as I said, about 10% are women. And of that 10%, almost all of them have experienced some sort of domestic violence, or in some cases with veterans, military sexual trauma, or intimate partner violence which as we know is a recurring problem among our, especially among our women, uh, our women in general and our women veterans, especially. Um, and so, oh, and then lastly, uh, oddly enough, and I can't really explain this, but about 10% of our veterans nationally, and also I'll just assume South Carolina is the same, choose to be homeless. Uh, they're not rendered homeless by any circumstances. Well, it might be by circumstance, but they're choosing to remain homeless. They have no interest in being sheltered. I quite frankly don't understand that. I, I don't get it. But, but that is a factor. And, and we run into that on occasion, especially in some of our parks uh, here in town, as well as other places around the state, that's true. And, and so there are tons of great programs. The US Department of Veterans Affairs in partnership with us and local nonprofits administer 
some great programs, the HUD-VASH program, which is really more about chronically homeless. And then the, the per diem grant, grant per diem program has some opportunities for building and sustaining existing facilities, getting transitional beds and working employment and other opportunities. Um, the, both Dorn here for us and Ralph Johnson in Charleston have homeless coordinators who also work the continuum of care across holistic health promotion, which includes substance abuse and employment opportunities, sheltering, um, drug, drug and alcohol testing, and in addition to mental and behavioral health and other counseling and therapy opportunities to include non-traditional or alternative therapies. So the programs are out there and, and we continue to strive for them. And we have blessed here in town with some great opportunities through nonprofits and the grant opportunities that have been provided them. So transitions right at the end of the ministry here is a great example of that. What Craig Curry, retired Army Colonel does leading over there is just spectacular. And he is a holistic viewing guy, but 180 place and, and, uh, and the many others echo in the more of the Eastern part of the state. There are a lot of great partners out there. So I would close by telling you, I'm extraordinarily honored to be in this job. I think we have nothing but uh, bright futures ahead of us. We got tons of work to do. Um, but this is good work. This is purposeful work. And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this position to give back to our state and, uh, and to do so in our great capital city. And so uh, for what y'all do every day, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, thank you very much for leadership. It is, it does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. Thank you. No, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And thank you for your service. And, um, and uh, I'm not sure, do we have a, co a written copy? of your report. I mean, there's some really, really good data in there uh, that, that would be helpful, particularly, I think, as we shape our discussions going forward. I think the um, the biggest challenge, uh, the, as, as we deal with veterans and, and our unsheltered population, and quite frankly, society in general, is going to be behavioral health the next um, 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 several years. I mean, we, we uh, the, the federal government, state government, um, has, has historically dis disinvested uh, in that space, and, and we're seeing the results of it. And, and, and it seems like there's a, there's a real wind in our sails now uh, to, to, to get some really thoughtful, long-term strategic investments and in, in helping um, helping people get back on track. So I'd love to have a copy of, of, of the report if we don't already have it. Yes, sir. So what I'll, what I'll offer you is we uh, were directed by the General Assembly to do a complete study on veteran issues in the last session. So three senators, three uh, members of the House, and me. And I uh, used part of my DOTUS grant to hire two uh, graduate research assistants from the University of South Carolina uh, who helped me out. And so we compiled a report. Much of this is contained in that. It's much broader than what I laid out. I would offer that that's a good start point. And then if there are questions or places you want to work on more some detail, I, I would be happy to do that or connect everybody to the right point. I'll, I'll have that mailed, uh, email, emailed over to the team. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. All right. Any other questions, General Grimsley? We good? All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Thank you, General. At this time, Mayor Benjamin, we will move into our fourth item, which is the Calhoun Street Road Diet and Bike Lane Project. Um, I've asked our staff to give an update on this project. It's my understanding it was recently mentioned in um, some type of community meeting or format and I believe that the information that was shared at the time was inaccurate and so we certainly want to um, make sure that the public has the accurate information on this project that has never been halted but certainly um, I've always instructed our staff to do our due diligence to make sure that we can do it the right way and so today we want to just briefly present to you these improvements that are planned and the outreach that must occur um, properly um, in a pan pandemic world that we've been living in. So with that, we have Ms. Dana Higgins, um, our city uh, director of engineering and Ms. Lucinda Statler, our planning administrator. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Good afternoon. Uh, Lucinda and I'd like to talk to you about the Calhoun Street improvements. The improvements that will consist of installing bicycle accommodations between Wayne and Hardin. Just to give you a little background, in 2012, the referendum was passed with a budget of $88,292 to restrike bike lanes. With that not being enough to do anything but restrike, the city went back to CTC in 2020 and we secured $556,000 additional. We've had two public meetings back in 2018 with the third meeting installed 
due to the COVID. Today, we are seeking council approval to resume public outreach and ultimately to move the project forward. Lucinda will go into more detail now. Thanks, Anna. So just briefly, um, the benefits of the proposed road diet are to provide reduced points of conflict for drivers. There will be, there will be wider, more comfortable driving lanes, <clears throat> and the road will maintain efficient turns by providing a center turn lane. And I'm just going to briefly click through a few slides that illustrate the various configurations of the block. These were designed to ensure maximum safety and minimal dis disruption of traffic patterns. Some blocks will add zeros to existing traffic lanes. Some will reduce the number of traffic lanes and eliminate parking on one side to provide designated bike lanes. And some blocks will maintain current traffic lanes and eliminate parking on one side to provide designated bike lanes. Block by block diagrams, such as this one, will be provided in the public meeting to illustrate the exact configuration of changes to each of the 13 affected blocks in the project. This is an example showing the blocks in assembly in Maine. The proposed schedule moving forward will be to hold a virtual public outreach session in June. The project would then go out to bid this fall, and we anticipate construction next spring. Possibly a BPAC bike ride or promotional event could be held for bike month in 2022. To summarize the, the outreach, uh, the June virtual meeting will use the Zoom, public input, and YouTube <clears throat> platforms to ensure access to all. Two to three weeks in advance, public notice will include a press release, a banner on the city's homepage with a link to the project <clears throat> pardon me, page, which will have project details and diagrams, email distribution to our existing distribution list, signs along the corridor to alert residents as well as commuters, and staff will contact neighborhood leaders directly. To summarize, we'd like to point out that this project has not been halted or stalled all efforts have been made to ensure proper funding is available to provide the best outcome for the project. Currently, all funding is in place. The CTC funding for resurfacing, as well as the penny tax funding for restriping. Given the unprecedented year we've had during COVID, we want to ensure that our outreach efforts are fresh, and today we are seeking council approval to proceed with public outreach and with implementation. And that's the end of the slides, and of course we can click back to anything that, that you guys want to look at. Thank you, Dana, Lucinda. I know this um, presentation is in council's inboxes in case they also need to share the accurate information with members of the public. Any right. questions? Are there any questions for staff, y'all? I can't see everyone with the screen up. So, Mr. McDowell. Okay. Still Go ahead. Mr. Mayor. Yes, no, sir. Let me just ask one question. Um, I understand that public input is scheduled for June. Yes, sir. We, have, there, we don't have a. Is it? Oh, sorry. Is there a specific date? We don't have a date scheduled yet. We were waiting for um, council's blessing to move forward, and then we would pick a date and start advertising that. What do we have? Let me ask you this then: Do we have public input prior? What I what I think you're asking is. Do we approve this and then have public input or is it just the reverse? I think they want oh. Reverend McDowell, you all's approval to move forward now with public input. And then once we get that input, we would you know, certainly be okay. coming back to you all again to reflect anything that um, we hear, you know, if any changes need to be made based off that input. Yes, sir. We just want to make sure that yes. you all are clear on where from the evolution of the project to now so that we can move forward with um, refreshing public input. Well, the reason I raised that, of course, I don't want a situation that happened, say, on Fair Road to happen again without, without um, the kind of input we need so that once we start a project, we don't turn around again and have to do something, do something else. Um, so yes, if we're just looking, if we're just asking the council to approve starting the process of public input, then of course I'm 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 okay with that. 
Yes, sir. Just, We're asking to get your approval to start it, to get your input on how you want it to be, where you, you know, virtual, in person, with socially distant mechanism, whatever you want to see. I think the staff and I are asking for your input on that, but certainly ready to move forward with some type of input. All right. Or as okay. much input as necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Other questions of Dana Lucinda? Thank you for the update. Let's, let's get this one done, y'all. Uh, all right. Good deal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving forward, we are now moving into the budget discussion, Mayor Benjamin and Council. And obviously, every year under normal circumstances we um, incorporate our water and columbia water update and our rate study review um, last year during the budget um, obviously we were not able to move forward with um, the the normal rate study progression of um, potential increases etc just due to circumstances um, you know i'm amazed at how this team has worked how you all have led in order for us to sustain ourselves through some very hard times. And with that, Clint um, is going to give you some information about Columbia Water, our progress um, that we've made, as well as you'll hear from Mr. Robert Chambers, the principal consultant at Black and Beach, who's always wonderful to assist us through our rate study review. And I think what you will find to be a very remarkable um, proposal um, to allow us to get back to sustain our infrastructure and our CIP, um, even during um, some difficult times. So we look forward to your feedback as we make our way through the presentation. So Mr. Clint Sheely, Assistant City Manager of Columbia Water will get us started. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Appreciate a, a little bit of time to be with you today. Um, I know that, uh, that, that we are, uh, under a time schedule, and um, but we'll do our best to, um, to to move through these slides as quickly as we can. This has been an unusual year, a most unusual year, but um, we wanted to share a couple of highlights with you and also the public. Um, and again, uh, most importantly, I want to focus on capital improvement program and our, our projects that are sort of critical as, as as we move forward and trying to advance. Um, a lot of the items and major significant projects and improvements um, as we move forward. So as Ms. Wilson said, Robert Chambers will follow this um, presentation with his review of our financial position and some rate recommendations as well and what we consider to be good news. But, but let's move forward with, um, with our agenda and y'all feel free to interject questions throughout. We'll talk a little bit about the impact of COVID on our operations. Um, we'll We'll briefly mention the AMI project and where that significant investment stands. Um, we feel like we need to provide an update about the consent decree. No, no Columbia Water briefing would be complete without doing that. And then again, spend some time talking about our capital improvements and some key projects that we would like to advance. And then we'll finish up with a review of, of just our stormwater progress. So in terms of utility operations, um, I really can't say enough about our staff in all areas, including utility operations, engineering, customer care, public works. Our, our, our folks have just done a remarkable job of, of showing up and moving forward all throughout the pandemic. I'm really, really proud of them and how they've responded to this challenge and, and how we've been able to provide essential services and, um, and be able to do that in, in an efficient way. Um, when you see some statistics about lost work days and about um, you know COVID positive tests, and this is just in Joey Jaco's um, area of operation, the operation. But um, obviously, we've been impacted quite a bit by, by positive test results and, and quarantines from from exposure. So that that's impacted our response time. Um, they're not where we want to be. Um, we're, we're not responding as quickly as we would like to be for a variety of reasons. Certainly COVID has slowed some of our momentum, but we have kept moving forward and um, we've kept providing essential services. And that's really a testament to our great staff. And I just want to thank them for, um, for doing what they do every day. The, uh, as, as we look forward, um, talking about utility operations and, and some of our areas, you can see a lot of 
vacancy statistics here. Um, we've been very intentional and strategic about bringing new folks into our operation during this pandemic. And so we, we've somewhat circled the wagons. Um, we've, we've worked a lot of overtime. We've, we've worked our folks really, really hard, but we knew they could work in a safe manner and they've done that. Um, but it leaves us in a position where we're not able to respond as quickly as we would like to. We're working on staffing back up um, and, and doing that in a smart way. But, but what we're trying to do is, is utilize outside contractors some local businesses through indefinite delivery contracts to assist us in meeting some of those critical needs and being responsive as we need to. So sometimes when y'all call about a, a water leak that's been four, six, eight weeks and we haven't been able to respond yet, um, a lot of times we'll engage a contractor if it's something significant. Um, and we're moving into, um, we just signed indefinite delivery contracts with five local protege contractors working with Melissa Lindler and her team to engage them to help us with service line leaks, yard restorations, small paving projects. So we, we wanna we wanna be as responsive as we possibly can and use our contracting community to fill that gap while we continue to staff up and, and train our folks. Our, our call center has also been very, very busy, particularly um, this calendar year. Um, they were impacted by COVID as well. Um, we have seen a significant increase in call volume. Um, part of that is due to our new phone system, which we're very excited about. It's got a callback feature um, where folks can leave a message and we call them back at a certain time. We are rolling out a new chat feature. I'm really excited about that. Um, the call volume has increased because we don't have the walk-ins at, at Washington Square. And then finally, when you resume this connection for non-payment, that generates a lot of phone calls. So. So we're getting uh, an unprecedented amount of, of uh, contact from our public and uh, Tiffany Latimer and her staff are doing a really good job trying to be responsive to that. And so we're, we're working on continuing to empower and motivate her staff. She's doing a really, really good job um, of working with our folks in, in customer care. And I hope you're seeing a difference there um, with, with, with what we've been doing. So I'm just very grateful for her We've got a lot of work left to do, but um, that team is very engaged in helping us close those gaps. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the growth in past due balance. Um, this is a graphic that you've seen before and we showed throughout the early stages of the pandemic as we suspended our disconnects for non-payment of water and sewer bills back in March. Um, we, we saw a steady increase, um, but thankfully we've seen a leveling out and maybe even as of uh, this week, a little bit of a dip in, in uh, the growth in greater than 30 days past due. So it seems that the tide is turning a bit. The message is getting out um, about payment arrangements and uh, about the need to pay to, to maintain water service. So um, we feel like this, this, this strategy of, of moving intentionally and slowly in terms of disconnecting service and, and is, is working. It is being effective. Um, we did not get to this point quickly. We're looking at 10 or 11 months worth of not disconnecting. So we won't stem that tide overnight and get the numbers back down, but we are starting to see a positive trend and we're excited about that. I do wanna mention, um, just show some graphics about the payment arrangements that we, we set up initially, if you remember back in October 1st, we placed everybody that was in arrears on a six month payment arrangement. That was about $9.2 million of indebtedness placed on a payment arrangement. And we sent out mailers and encouraged folks to pay those past due bills. And between October 1st and January 4th, we collected almost $1.2 million of that 9.2 indebtedness that we rolled on the payment arrangements in, in October. In, in January, we started sending out notification that we'll, we would begin disconnections for non-payment in mid-February. That notification alone between the mid-January and mid-February dates, we collected about a million dollars of that indebtedness. After we started disconnecting for, uh, for non-payment, the, the February to March statistics looked even better. We collected over one and a half million dollars of that indebtedness. And then as we continued moving, moving forward, the, the mid-March to mid-April numbers were at almost $1.8 million. So collectively, we, we brought in about five and a half of that 9.2 million that was put on payment arrangement 
in October. Folks are still working and paying down those payment arrangements. I want to let you know we, we heard you loud and clear of a compassionate approach, and we've been following that approach throughout. Um, I would say the vast majority, if not every single customer that we have disconnected their water service, almost every customer, if not everyone, has been able to pay a minimal, nominal payment, first installment of payment arrangement, and have service restored the next day or same day of being disconnected. So we don't have a lot of customers out of water and without water service. We've been very, um, very intentional about being compassionate and, and trying to keep folks in water service as we encourage them to, to pay their bills. We know that assistance programs are on the way. Missy Kaufman's gonna to speak to those a little bit later, but um, we've been publicizing the, the, the county's uh, rental assistance program. We know there's some programs coming through Health and Human Services that are specifically geared toward helping folks pay utility bills, water and sewer bills. And so we're looking forward to that. And as soon as we get that information, that's the first thing that customer care folks share with callers that have had a service interruption and are behind on their bills. So we're going to be very intentional about publicizing that information also. I wanted to provide a brief update about our, our automated metering infrastructure. Uh, we are about two thirds complete. We've got over 100,000 meters in the ground that have been updated with this new AMI technology. So we are on target estimating completion in March of 2022. We've been promoting and advertising our Island Water app and we're starting to see usage of that application increase. We're seeing greater meter registrations and decreased field visits for meter rechecks. That's a real positive. Those have dropped by about a third. So, so we're really starting to, to see the benefit and, and we're seeing a really good return on investment um, for, for what we're doing there through, through these various um, programs and tools that are available for not only our staff, but also our customers. So feeling very positive about that. We're transitioning meter reading staff into other duties and that's been, been a positive impact as well. Um, doing a really good job of, 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 of getting meter reads for those 50,000 or so meters that are still out there that haven't been upgraded yet. So we have seen a considerable increase in the need for meter box replacements and backflow prevention devices. Um, there were certain assumptions made for the base bid that was placed out there, and those assumptions were, were woefully low, I would say. And so we're having to, in order to do this project, well and do it correctly, we're having to um, add some more dollars to it. So we've got an amendment on your agenda today that's quite sizable, but it does give us back for prevention protection at every residential meter, and we're replacing damaged boxes that we're seeing out there. So um, we've evaluated different alternatives. We put a memo in your agenda packet with more detail, but um, we believe this is the best option for us to get a good, complete project and to push that to completion in March of 2022. Just a quick map showing we're touching all areas of the system and um, have been very effective at canvassing the system and again, excited about where we're headed. We have not, it hasn't been a, a, a project that hasn't had some issues and leaks and, and different issues with the meters. But for the most part, when you've touched 100,000 meters, the, the incident rate of, of calls has been pretty low. And um, so we're pleased with, with the work that's happening and the response to correcting any of those issues that may have come up. Again, I want to give you a quick update about our consent decree. Um, we're on schedule with all of our deliverables. We've got several very important deliverables coming up. Um, the Supplemental Infrastructure Rehabilitation Report and Capacity Assurance Program Hydraulic Modeling Report um, out there for approval. Those are very, very important. There's a lot tied to when those programs are approved. Um, so, so we're moving forward. We're continuing our progress. I, I will say that, that we did lose a little bit of momentum during the COVID year, partly because we had a reduced uh, capital improvement program. We went from a uh, uh, down to $40 million combined for water and sewer, and so we weren't able to deliver on quite as many projects as we had hoped. But we are continuing uh, our forward momentum, and we're meeting our deadlines, and that's really important, and we're doing our best to minimize any capacity limitations, capacity restricted areas, but I do want to focus on those really quickly um, as, as we move forward. Uh, I think it's important to know that the second bullet item that um, we 
we have we basically matched our funding levels with our project execution for the past three years. So some of the bottlenecks that were within within our different uh, different procedures that we, we need to follow have been streamlined and, and we're able to get the work out on the street, get the investment of the dollars that you're approving in the ground and that's making a real difference for us. So um, the machine is ready to chew up the next round of work um, and we're ready to do that. I also wanna mention that um, we, we're, we're thinking outside the box. We've got some projects that are very time sensitive and, and so we've challenged the team to look at various project delivery methods, alternative project delivery methods to deliver these projects quicker, to get the infrastructure investments and improvements made a little bit quicker than our traditional design bid build process. So we're working our way through one of those right now and you'll see more of that type of approach to come where it makes sense for us and is, is efficient and cost effective for us. You may wonder where we are in terms of our total spend, in terms of our work away out of this obligation um, under a consent decree. And um, we're, in terms of spend, we're at about the halfway point. We've spent over $360 million investing in our wastewater system to, to uh, satisfy these needs that are out there, but what was estimated to be a, a $750 million expenditure. So we're well on our way in this journey, but we're right in the middle of a very capital intensive campaign to improve capacity and reduce sanitary sewer overflow so we can work our way out of this consent decree. I wanted to speak just a moment about the capacity limited areas. There are quite a few out there that if we are not able to deliver projects and, and invest in the system in increased capacity, that moratoriums will, will, will cascade down, and that means slowing down development. That means no, you know, no additional capacity for folks to, to build and tie onto our system in a lot of areas if we aren't able to, to meet certain project deadlines. So those are, those are concerning for us. I don't want to mislead you. They're very concerning. We have invested heavily in areas like Lake Catherine. We've invested in Crane Creek. And uh, we're investing in the downtown area to make sure we don't have those moratoriums. Those were tied to sanitary sewer overflows. This next phase of consent decree deliverable, this capacity assurance program, begins looking at the hydraulic model and is more of a forward look, anticipating where overflows might occur, and that can place us into development moratorium as well. So we've got to be very intentional about meeting deadlines moving forward. It's a different set of criteria that is about to, to, to be imposed upon us as part of the consent decree. And so we've got to really, again, be intentional about delivering on the projects so that we don't find ourselves in, in those situations. We, we are looking at a, an extension request for COVID. Um, we don't want to place our, 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 our future of being able to develop our system on being granted that extension. We hope we'll be granted that extension. We believe we'll be granted an extension. We're not relying on an extension. We're moving forward as fast as we can to make sure we don't have issues. I'm going to show you a map. Yellow is an area where we're projecting one year or less of restriction of capacity limitation. Red, we're expecting greater than a year. The green is, um, is a, uh, the Crane Creek Basin and downtown is not shaded, but I mentioned because of the ability to advance some projects, we, we, we feel really good about Crane Creek, that we can stay out of moratorium there if we're able to do one or two more specific projects. Um, downtown area, we're, we're investing in the East Rocky Branch Basin. We've got another project this coming year, CIP, that's going to help continue to support development there. You'll see our shift is moving toward the Saluda River Basin. We've had some overflows there. We have some modeling results that are showing capacity restrictions there as we move into the future. So that's where a lot of our investment will go in the coming years. And we fear if we're not able to continue down the path of, of taking care of these next projects for, for this, this coming year, if those get pushed, then the, the Saluda River Basin projects get pushed as well, and it's a domino effect. So we really want to try to stay ahead of that curve as much as possible. Um, a lot of the projects you'll see here, 
Kenley Creek, Lower Saluda River, um, West Columbia, Saluda River Force Main Extension, all those are tied to that Saluda River Basin. But there is some Crane Creek work in here, also some Broad River Basin work as well. So that's a lot of where a lot of our capacity limited areas could be. And we want to make sure we stay ahead of that curve or finish those projects right on time as much as we can. There's not a lot of float in the schedule here. It's going to be very tight, very close for a lot of these. And um, if we don't get some, some COVID relief, then, then we're looking at really just a matter of weeks and days and months of trying to, trying to finish under a deadline. So um, we're very concerned about this, and I know you are as well, but we wanted to, to just remind you about these areas and these critical projects that are coming up. In terms of our delay request for our COVID force majeure, we submitted a letter back in February that was a, really an excellent summary of the impacts so far. We did not request a specific timeline because the pandemic and its impact on our operation is not over. And so um, in talking with our attorneys, we're anticipating uh, fall of this year, um, making our more formal request um, and, and for a time extension and, and painting the very full picture of what this impact has been. And um, we will be letting you know, and we'll be, we'll be pulling out all the stops to um, call everyone that we know um, to a lobby for this, this um, delay because it really impacts. We wanna build back in a little bit of breathing room in our schedules if possible. So that is our target for the COVID request. Um, I wanna mention our capital improvement program and spend just a, a moment of time there um, we are requesting $120 million for capital improvements for this coming fiscal year. Um, that has been our, our steady path many years, and, and, and we've been able to, to absorb that through our rate work and through our finance, um, being able to finance and bonding and whatnot. But um, we, if you remember, we contracted to $40 million last year because we weren't able to, to make a rate adjustment. This $120 million is split one third for drinking water and two thirds for wastewater. So it's a $40 million drinking water capital improvement plan. I'll just highlight a couple of projects here that are, are um, very, very important and some that are um, unfortunately non negotiable for us. Utility conflicts, $8 million for water. You'll see another $8 million for sewer. That doesn't count the Carolina Crossroads work that's happening. DOT has been very, very active. These are areas where we don't have prior rights and the projects are so small that the Act 36 reimbursement doesn't cover our utility relocation. So there's still an impact on us. It's not nearly the impact that we would have if, if not um, for Act 36 passing. So we're fortunate that passed um, and that's gonna help us on big projects like Carolina Crossroads. We are communicating, working well with DOT to try to minimize impacts, but the reality is there's a, there's a cost to us um, that for, for relocating our lines where we don't have prior rights. The alternative raw water pump station at the canal water plant, you'll see the money plugged in there. We're hoping we'll be successful with our uh, resilience grant application to FEMA. We'll find out in June. But again, that's a 75% grant, 25% match. So we really need to feed that money in there, even if we're successful getting the grant to cover our 25% match. If that project were taken off the list, um, that st stops that or slows down, almost stops the entire canal recovery effort because that project is key to derating the hazard classification for our canal embankment and moving forward with the FEMA project to restore the canal to the lower hazard classification. So very, very important work there. And I also want to mention the Shandon and Rosewood water quality improvements, moving forward with the first phase of those, seven and a half million dollars each. We um, routinely get brown water complaints from those areas. We do our best to, to flush and, and try to make sure we, um, we're responding, but, but those, are, those are really, really important projects that we wanna move forward as much as possible. So, um, so that's our water CIP. I'll show you a quick map. The, air, the items that I've shaded in red are ones that if, if we have to reduce the CIP, our capital improvement investment, those are the ones that, that would have to come off and, and that's real pain there. Um, that's real, um, real problems that we, we really need to address. So we view those two projects as critical to, to move forward if, with our phase improvement to replacing aging infrastructure. So I wanna move on to our wastewater um, capital improvement program. 
um, and, and talk about that just for a moment. The, um, here you'll see some capacity projects right at the top. Um, East Rocky Branch, very, very important to being able to continue the development and the growth in our downtown area. Lower Crane Creek, also very important. We're seeing tremendous growth in the Northeast, a lot of subdivisions, and we want to be able to continue that service. And that's a very, very important project to keeping us out of any type of moratorium for that basin. Um, yeah, I, I, I neglected to mention rehabilitation also, um, but as this year we were not able to put as much money into rehabilitating our system, and that's something if you get behind on, it's hard to catch up. And so we want to try to continue that and, and, and beef up our investment in rehabilitation to the maximum extent possible, because when we don't rehabilitate our system, that directly leads to sanitary sewer overflows. So here you see a lot of smaller projects that are very, very important to us reducing sanitary sewer overflows to hitting some of those smaller hot spots that are out there. And I mentioned the utility relocation efforts that we, we, we are simply obligated to do. And then there's some compliance and maintenance items in our Metro Wastewater Treatment Plant that we really need to, 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 to carry forward this year, if at all possible. A lot of red on this next map. Those red items were identified as ones that we would have to drop off if we if we pull back on our CIP from 120 just to $80 million. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why I'm showing an $80 million level there. The, the, the reason is because last year when we talked about rates and, and we were starting the pandemic, we contemplated $40 million for this current year and just $80 million for the, the coming year. Um, we're seeing, and I think you'll hear through Robert Chambers' presentation, the ability to support $120 million. But I really wanted you to see in both the water and sewer side the, the, the pain that we would feel and, and, and would be um, imposing on our, our, our staff and our efforts to, to unwind ourselves from the consent decree on the development community and also on, on our customer base if, if we're not able to fully fund. So, so we're going to be asking for a fully funded capital improvement program at the $120 million level. I also wanted, before I turn things over to Robert, um, and, and really before I talk, start talking about our sewer expansion fees, um, I just wanted to, to, to mention that that Robert Chambers and, and our finance group, and Jeff Palin, Missy Kaufman, Dan Alonzo, the entire team has done a really, really good job of pulling together our rate work. And I think you're going to see what, what we think are very good results. It's the hard work of a lot of people um, and, and the, the byproduct of some creative financing work, some very strong economic development work, um, and again, our staff. So I think you're going to hopefully you'll, you'll see this as good news. I did want to mention expansion fees um, as, as you consider a rate ordinance. We're also going to be looking at a revision to our, our sewer expansion fee ordinance um, that will be beneficial to commercial users. Um, it will be a net result of a 33% reduction in that commercial fee. And we've talked about this reduction before, so th this is not news. And also the, the change calculation for yard, large users that allowed us to recruit really big industries that make a very positive impact on our, our revenue stream. So um, you'll see that coming before you as a revi ordinance revision request um, at the appropriate time. But we're also looking at making some policy um, revisions and changes, um, granting folks um, that, that maybe with a change in use in a building that has, has had a large meter, they paid a fairly large expansion fee, and then they're looking to maybe change that to a restaurant. Um, we're looking to give a little more credit for what was paid initially so that the person doing the redevelopment doesn't have to pay quite as much on their end. And there's also some discussion about an economic development fund. So looking at all those types of items to, um, to continue our forward progress with um, expansion fees and trying to recruit industrial development as well. So I'll finish up really quick with stormwater. Um, you can see the maps and the projects that have been completed, like Gills Creek debris removal. Um, very successful there, our Devil's Ditch project that was in conjunction with the county, MLK Park detention, but a lot of other work that is planned. So I want to highlight some of that. Um, we've awarded over $17 million in construction contracts and almost $12 million in consultant contracts. And we've spent, of that amount awarded, we've spent almost $17 million to date. We mentioned the projects completed. 
Harlem Heights is in construction. Shandon is under design. Penn Branches will be moving to construction, we, we believe, next year or so. Really excited about the progress of our, our stormwater projects as well. The, um, in terms, this is our CIP, and we're requesting about $11 million. Um, we're continuing to work the plan. If you remember, we paused our rate adjustment last year. We, we had a five-year plan that we were working through. Um, we'll be asking to move with our fourth step. In July of 2019, we went uh, up to $13.32 per month. This step is, is moving up to $14.15 that we'll be asking for on the monthly fee. And again, that is the fourth or five adjustment that you contemplated um, several years ago. So with that, I'll see, I'll pause for a moment. I'm sorry for the, the fire hose delivery there, um, it, but I just wanted to try to share as much information as quickly as we could um, and then get ready to, to turn over to Robert Chambers. But I wanted to see if y'all had any questions about the capital improvement program, the level of funding we're asking for, or any of our programs. And, and Clint, I would add, um, obviously there's a method to this madness today with y'all, as Clint said, there's a lot of information, but we're having to do it in this order so that as Missy Kaufman comes forward and, and we work with you through the each fund, you'll have the background information as to how we built the budget. So we've got to show you the water and sewer request, the rate study. We're going to then go into the American Rescue Plan recommendations because they build into the final budget presentation that we'll give you today. So I'm sorry to add that, Clint, but I just wanted to make sure council was understanding why we're going in the order that we are. And if you have any questions. That's very helpful. Mr. McDowell. Clint, let's just let me say thank you so much for that very comprehensive report. Thank you very much. Uh, three, three issues that I want you to, to at least briefly talk about. I want to say a word of thanks to you and uh, and of course with the new phone system that has helped tremendously. Uh, the reason I know that is that I've gotten several calls referencing some of the issues and they've been very due diligent about uh, getting back in touch with the clients, with the residents. Of course, uh, the other thing, of course, now Clint, there are some infrastructure leaks in the community of which you and I have talked about it. several of those kinds of issues. Um, are we going to continue to wade our way through this so that those things can be repaired? Yes, sir. And, and um, that's the response time that, that we're not necessarily proud of and, and we haven't um, yeah. progressed as far as we had hoped. And so um, we're, our staff are working every weekend, councilmen, and, and really doing everything they can. But we recognize that, that some of the response is unsatisfactory. And so that's the reason we're, we've got indefinite delivery contracts for leak repair and restoration. And in fact, we're on your agenda tonight, there's a, a local BBE contractor that we're seeding more money. We're amending, asking to amend their contract so that they can continue helping us. Um, we've got a meeting tomorrow morning to to talk about how to better use those local contracting resources sure. as staff augmentation to help us be more responsive. Great. Look, one last one last question. Um, there has been some glitches in the AMI in the AMI um, um, uh, configuration of communities and that sort of thing, which has caused, I think. Uh, some exorbitant water rates, water fees. You all have done well, of course, in uh, when someone calls and we talk, uh, they immediately make sure that issue is rectified. Um, so there are some glitches there and we are constantly working on those things. Yes, sir, absolutely. The, um... And, and occasionally they, they make the news media as well. Um, so we, uh, we, we are being responsive to those customers um, and we've got a system of, of, of catching the vast majority of those elevated bills and reviewing them. And, and the AMI system and the data that it provides to us has been so helpful in diagnosing those. 
um, you know, very quickly. But we do have an occasional error where there, there's a, you know, something has been transposed incorrectly and you get a data dump and, and we're trying to catch those because a lot of times they just don't look right. But we've also run into some where we've been able to, to help folks figure out they've got a dripping faucet or we had a gentleman tell us, you know what, I did, I did leave the water hose running for three days in the backyard. And so we can see exactly when they, they cut it on and cut it all. And it's that, that level of detail in terms of the water usage. So it's really a powerful tool in helping figure out, is there a billing error? Is there a leak? Is there something else going on? But we've touched, again, over 100,000, and we have had a few issues, but they are very, very small in relation to the total number of meters that we've touched. And we are being very intentional and, and, and trying to respond to those customers and make sure we give them an equitable resolution when, we, when sure. there is, a, you know, some sort of a billing issue. So if you all hear of any others, please send them to myself or Tiffany, and we will respond immediately and, and work with the customer to get those things taken care of. Well, that has worked tremendously well, particularly with several instances in the, um, that I know about and that I've contacted you all about. You've uh, due diligently took care of that. And uh, so what turned into an additional three zeros, uh, it was just <laughs> one zero. So I, I appreciate the team doing that. And of course, it would help tremendously if we can, can continue to uh, uh, operate on that same on that same claim. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Davis. You're on mute, Sam. Sorry, is the system going down? I've gone out twice. No. Anyway, maybe it's 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 something in the area. Um, Ed touched on a couple of things that I wouldn't want to repeat, um, but I will say that uh, <clears throat> I'm also getting some positives about um, the phone system answering and so forth and how we've made some changes there. Uh, one, one question that uh, I, I, I really can't answer with folks, uh, such as the one you got for me this morning about what, 6.30, quarter seven? Clint? Yes, sir. If I take a look at it. Um, the leaks, you know, we do have an development amount of leaks throughout. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that we're trying to do it with some local subs, small contractors. But uh, how, how do you really... Um, assess and maybe rate uh, the system underground throughout the city. There's an uh, exorbitant amount of leaks, and and uh, then we've got the issue that uh, of who does the cleanup work. Do, does DOT partner with us on that, or do we? do the repairs, come back and do the resurfacing and, and that sort of thing. So, yes, sir. Um, if, if we have a, a water leak in, in, in our infrastructure, it doesn't matter if it's a city street, a county maintained road or DOT maintained road, our responsibility is to repair the leak and restore the roadway and the customer's yard to as good or better than we found it. Um, sometimes we aren't as, as fast in doing that as we would like. And so that's where our, our contracting help is going to come in and help us. They're helping us already. We're, gonna, we're trying to be um, a little more strategic about how we're going to utilize those resources so that we can respond quicker. Our folks are working really hard. There's just a high volume of work right now. Um, they are catching up. They've been working every weekend. They're catching up. But we've still got a lot of lingering work orders that are out there. And y'all didn't hear me mention today Mobile City Works, but that is, uh, that is an initiative that we had last year that we really haven't advanced very far for a variety of reasons. I don't want to blame everything on COVID and use that as an excuse, but we haven't made the progress that we had hoped and we had committed to making. We do commit to making that progress this year. 
that's going to help us with our tracking and closing the loop and make sure that making sure things don't get lost so that you aren't getting the call of, hey, I reported this six months ago, where is it? Um, it's also going to help our call takers have information that they can share with folks that, that, that call and inquire about the status. So a big initiative for us that we want to push forward hard this year. We have a, a system that is both urban but also very rural in parts of, of, of the county. And, and so we've got a lot of water mains that have some age on them and a lot of opportunity for folks to dig up our water mains and, and create breaks. And we've got a lot of breaks on our own. But doing things like the, the improvements in Rosewood and Shandon, Earlwood, Book of Washington Heights, that helps from a water quality standpoint, but it also addresses areas where we have frequent leaks. So we're, we're trying to be strategic in replacing the more brittle unlined cast iron infrastructure. We know the materials that are out there, and that's why we build a list to try to address not only water quality complaints, but routine leaks as well. So again, it's a, it's a long game process, but we're, we're in the middle of working that and trying to get um, the infrastructure renewed and fix leaks in a timely manner until we can get infrastructure replaced. Yeah, I think a, a per periodic updates on the topic would help you know uh i try to do my best to explain to folks why the, you know the leaks are there and how fast it's going to take um to our guys to get there but uh i don't like to say it's just an aging system you know it may it may be in some areas it may not be but uh it, it would be helpful to me to know how we're progressing on that um and uh you know Sometimes folks, you give them that information and they understand, but, but the, uh, I try to assure them that the delay is, is not just because we, we can't get there, but we just have a good number of them happening. And, yes, sir. I, I, will, um, I will invite you. Uh, we, we've got in, in the first two weeks of May, we haven't scheduled it yet, but we're going to have a, a, a workshop socially distanced at our Beltline facility where we describe fully how we work through the city works process and what the city works mobile and what our, how our, our progression is going there. We're going to talk a lot about leaks and how we're responding both now and what the future looks like. So I'll, I'll be sure and share that, that date with you as well. Sign me up. Well, Clint, yes, Clint, thank you. Clint, I know that Mr. Um, Davis is a highly trained welder. Uh, so he needs, he needs some more work out there in these streets. Uh, I think he's volunteering himself for service. We can't plug uh, those holes, buddy. Philip, Philip, Philip Simmons trained well down out there, uh, uh, making things happen for you. Put him to work. Ah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has questions for Clint. Uh, Clint, um, I mean, the, uh, the, the significance of, of so many major projects you have going on from from water to wastewater, storm water, to AMI, uh, to just completely. Um, um, I mean, you and I, mean, I, I stay in Tiffany's and in, in, in the everything from the tone, the responsiveness, the tone, the the whole nine yards. I mean, it, it's just been solid. And I know you're juggling a whole lot of really major uh, projects at the same time. And I, I just I think you guys have done a great job. And just you just really lean on us uh, as much as we can, yeah. as, particularly as as we uh, engage with federal policymakers, um, uh, EPA, FEMA, and everything else, as to how we can be uh, helpful. But um, and, and some of those projects you mentioned, uh, you know, we I, I'm, I'm committed to continuing to invest in the system. We've been doing the right thing collectively uh, for a good while now. We're seeing the results uh, of it, and some of the things you had shaded in red, we can't, we can't take them off the list. We got to continue to to make these investments. To, to replace some of these um, uh, old metal lines from 40, 50, 50, 60 years ago. So no, um, I'm impressed with the, with the progress. Let's, let's, let's keep up putting the gas. I was about to say, if you don't mind, we've come a long way with uh, the decree and EPA, so, so forth and so on. Anybody who understands that history would know that uh, we, we have made progress and there. I, I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel, but you know, there's some things that's beyond our control every now and then. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. Any other questions, uh, uh, Clint, Daniel? 
Yeah, I just I, I would ask Clint if maybe at, at, at a future council meeting you could give us a little more insight on uh, potentially the private sector growth, uh, reaching out to those uh, minority and disadvantaged businesses and, and creating more opportunities there because it's something we've talked about you know for the last several years a lot about and looking at the staffing needs that we have I think it's probably the best time for us really to push that even further because one of the struggles we have as you and I know is is getting some it's not fixing the the leaks and so forth it's the going back and repairing the asphalt and the cleanup and the repairs that that linger on and and um I'd love to know more how we're we're growing that and taking advantage of the talent that we have in our community to fulfill those needs because, um, you know, our our guys can only do so much. I mean, they just they can't work a hundred hours a week. It's just not possible. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to grow some businesses, um, and it gives them the ability to grow without having to deal with all the issues of higher bonding and everything else so it's an opportunity for us to to really grow these small businesses here so i'd really like to have some time here in the next next month or so when you have time to really kind of dive into it deeper and understanding where this could end up going yes sir we'll do it all right to do thank you so much thank you very much thank you um so robert chambers is is next i asked robert to share his screen if he can and um and and present the the rate study with you chambers hey hey clint thank you very much uh mr. <laughs> uh mr mayor uh city manager council thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present uh i please let me know when you're able to see uh my screen go okay so we will go over the purpose highlight some of your um you know ever evolving drivers uh discuss some of the assumptions that went into developing the financial plan um and then we'll go about this discussing the financial plan and a few other items so as you all are aware, we're here for, you know, three basic reasons, you know, to establish uh, the financing around your operating and capital program, to, to understand the cost to provide service and to make sure that in, in providing this service, mm -hmm. okay, you all price the service appropriately and the, the revenues that you recover as a result are adequate to meet your requirements. So last year we initiated this discussion and we highlighted, you know, what considerations a resilient utility uh, would look for, what is going on in the market as it relates to the top industry issues. For example, on a few occasions during uh, Mr. Sheila's presentation, we highlighted and discussed aging infrastructure. We spoke about resilience uh revenues you know we spoke about the phone system and other information technology and customer systems some of the same issues that you're grappling with as our other utilities but then a year ago when we had this discussion uh we discussed the impact of COVID-19 at the time we were in the early days uh, of this journey and we, we really didn't understand, even though we we're trying to plan the best we could, we really didn't understand what the impact could have been going forward. Uh, as of right now, you know, we're over a year into this process. We have some more better data and empirical evidence. And while we're still going through it, we're better able to plan and understand the impacts today and as we go forward. And as a result, 
we are still at the same point as it relates to what are our drivers, what it is we're trying to do. At its core, we're trying to maintain a sustainable utility system that allows us to appropriately plan the finances, maintain the business excellence, and engage our stakeholders, okay? We know that we've looked at issues around revenue stability, how resilient our operations are, are we pricing these services appropriately, and can we remain competitive? Those items still continue to be drivers and components that kind of push um, yourselves, uh, the other utility leaders uh, within your organization to, 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 to make tough decisions and grapple with, with complex issues. And we're still seeing those same drivers as we progress uh, today. Um, historically, um, you as an entity have taken action as it relates to looking about adjusting, passing revenue or rate adjustments as needed to maintain uh, the requirements of your system. You know, last year, given the existing situation in FY21, we did not um, go about passing a, a, a revenue or rate increase. Uh, we're proposing a rate increase in FY22, which we will go over in detail in a few slides. So what are the assumptions associated um, with the financial plan we're going to be presenting today? In essence, we're going to provide an overview of three basic scenarios. The first scenario is what we call the FY21 action. What we proposed to you last year, uh, and based on what we proposed, then we're going to provide scenario one, which is a financial plan that implements a $120 million CIP in 22 through 26, which is the planning period. Additionally, we're going to talk about uh, Project Sunshine, which is the, the addition of a new client to the system. And, and the impact of that addition will be evident in both scenarios. Scenario two will go about listing an $80 million CIP and the results as such in FY22. And then from 23 onwards, it would be a CIP of 120 million. One thing we really wanted to highlight, and it's been said on a few, few occasions thus far, I'd just like to, to acknowledge and, and, and recognize staff as it relates to the diligence that has been shown through this time and even leading up to this point as it relates to financial planning, turning, turning every stone and making sure that we scoured every alternative to try to you know, provide the services at the lowest cost to your existing customers. You, 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 you achieved some savings in your recent uh, debt offering, the refunding offering, uh, which has assisted and is evident as a part of the study. And then your economic development uh, department for continuing to pursue new and significant customers on your system. Uh, and we're starting to see the, the impact of that initiative. And you know, your improved registration of new customers as a result of your water metering program. All, all these items have come together to, to have an impact on your financial planning. And we just wanted to highlight and recognize as such. So here we have the basic results. The third column, FY21 selected, highlights what we showed you last year. In FY21, uh, for the year 21, there was no rate increase. We lowered the CIP to about 40 million with the plan of going back to about 80 million in 22, and then 120 onward. Uh, based on last year's forecast, we're anticipating about a 10.15 increase in FY22. And then we are at you know, mid to high 7% onward. Uh, based on the analysis and the diligence that was done by staff based on the scenario one, which is in FY22, 120 million in CIP, we're seeing a FY22 revenue increase of about 5.02%. And that's what we'll be proposing today uh, as a part of scenario one. Thereafter, we jump up to about a 7.96 and we're at 
we average about the mid 6% from 24 onward. Now scenario two, which is the scenario whereby in FY22, we look at an 80 million CIP. We're looking at a revenue increase in FY22 of about 4.18%. And then, you know, we, we go up and down as it relates to about 6.67 in 23, 6% in 24, 707 in 25 and onwards. Um, but this is just showing you the, the, the relationship and the importance of, of the CIP and the impact to your required revenue increases and the diligence and the impact of that diligence planning as a result of what we were seeing last year prior to COVID and the situation you're going through. So to provide a little more detail, in FY22, which is the test year for scenario one, we're looking at a revenue total of about 162.3 million. Uh, we're estimating about a half a percent growth in accounts. And we're seeing declining average use per customers, which is pretty evident because of learned and new usage patterns. Okay. We still have other revenue sources, which includes, but is not limited to expansion fees, installation fees, and other service fees. And then we have the incorporation of, of, of Project Sunshine, which is a high volume water and sewer customer slash user. Uh, we're estimating that in FY22, uh, revenues associated with this customer that the city or that Columbia Water will recognize will be about 25% uh, in year two, which is FY23 about 75%, and then in 24 onwards, you will, it will build out, the project will build out and you'll see the full revenue potential. As it relates to the costs or the expense side, uh, operating expenses in FY22 is about 99.1 million uh, with an annual escalation uh, factor of about 4%. Uh, we're proposing the 120 million CIP uh, and we propose an initial FY22 um, debt offering of about 88.9 million. Uh, in addition, we're, as we always try, we're looking at a, a balanced approach to meeting your operating and capital requirements and meeting your established financial metrics, one of which is debt service coverage, which is revenues over debt. So, you know, just providing a little more information as it relates to the, the characteristics of scenario one over the forecast period, we're looking at about 68.5 in revenue bond funding, 31.5 in, in, in system funding. Uh, in addition, we've listed all your bond issuance amounts. In the first three years, we're you know, over 80 million per year in issuances. And then the final two years, 25 and 26, we go down to about 78.5 and 76 million respectively. And that's in bonding that we'll go to market to seek. Uh, and this plan and this program is what we've been utilizing as a guidepost um, to meet the clean water program and the requirements to make sure your capacity requirements are, are, are sorted to make sure that on an ongoing basis, you're rehabbing and reinvesting into your system um, appropriately. And we always continue to highlight and provide this overview to you just so that we can continue to follow and track um, the implementation of these programs. So going into the details of the financial plan, and I won't go into implicit details of every line item, but the total revenues of the system, which is line 11 in 22 is about 185.1 million and it grows to about 252 million. Uh, we have line 12, our operating expenses, line 16, our total debt service requirements. The big thing we try to make sure we do here as a part of your financial planning effort is make sure we meet our financial metrics in an adequate and appropriate fashion, one of which is debt service coverage. You have an internal uh, 
requirement of a 2.0 and in meeting that requirement, appropriately funding your capital program and then trying to implement the lowest possible uh, revenue increases or rate increases for your existing customers, um, those three items become the levers and the balancing components in developing the financial plan. And, and right now for FY22, we're proposing a 5.02 uh, revenue increase. Uh, any, any, any questions here? I know this is a point where we may or may not have questions, uh, or should I continue? Continue. Why don't you continue, Robert? No problem. Okay. So this is just a basic summary of the scenario one uh, financial plan, and we've gone over it uh, a few a few times. So looking at the bill impact, you know, over the life of the program, as we have documented and tracked, and we've presented on an annual basis. We've always tried to look at a smooth path um, as it relates to annual increases. And since 08 to 22, you know, the, the typical average increase in the bill and the compounded average is about just over 4%, which in some capacity tracks with the cost of money. Okay. But the more intriguing and real interesting component is okay you know what are you what are you getting for what you pay you know what what what's the value of water uh, and on a daily basis you know water costs you your customers on average about 77 cents per day and wastewater is about a dollar 42 per day you know <laughs> so if you had a you know if you had a a situation where you went about buying let's say a gallon of bottled water for a dollar, that'd be still be over 250 times more than what you'd pay for water. And what are the benefits and the value that you gain? You know, you're able to shower, use, you know, shower, wash, drink that water, eat, do a tons of stuff. Uh, and, and, and that's the value you get. And, and what we, if there's anything we want to highlight here, while the numbers on a daily basis, uh, it may seem lower for various reasons than other examples, what we truly want to highlight is not just the number, but the value of the service that you're getting and how critical and important it is, it is as we all know, to daily life and living. Okay. So on average, your exist your typical utility bill, which is just under six thousand gallons per month for the typical customer, will grow by about three dollars and 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 twenty two twenty four cents on average, uh, from about sixty four point five five to sixty seven point seven nine, uh, and when we break it down and compare each bill, water separately, uh, and sewer as compared to your neighbors you are both in the middle. So your bill is still uh, you know, competitive um, based on uh, the comparison we have here for water. On the sewer side, we're seeing you know, about you know, the same relationship, um, but you know, sewer is a, a, there's a little more cost associated with sewer. And you know, that's understandable given the clean water program and, and, and other projects that you're currently undertaking um, to maintain the integrity and the level of service um, associated with the sewer system. Okay, going on now to the, the high volume rate. So, so what is the high volume rate? What is this all about? I know we've discussed this before, but at its core, this rate is targeted for a customer that requires water service in the amount of about 300,000 gallons or greater per day. Um, this is being established to recognize and segment uh, the service demand and requirements um, of Columbia Water um, to provide water store service to this customer. And, and, and most importantly, it's been established to, to facilitate and support 
economic development within the, the, the city of Columbia, um, and more importantly, to facilitate Columbia Water's footprint um, throughout the region. The, the, the objectives are, you know, to have this rate and the service be representative of the, the actual cost of Columbia Water to provide this service. Uh, the objective was that it should be simple, easy to understand and create the least possible impact um, at implementation uh, to the target customers. And at its core, it should promote economic development. And that's been a, a, an important initiative for the city. And this is just another tool in the effort to keep pushing and acknowledging that, that initiative and its importance. It is in alignment with the financial planning approach that we have utilized and we continue to utilize um, on an annual basis. And what, what I'd like to do is just talk about um, the scenario that we're going to present. Um, the, the, an existing customer or the existing customer who may suit this, this high use rate in your current system um, is potentially an outside the city uh, commercial customer. Um, the scenario that we're presenting will look at and target the high use rate associated with, with that service um, as a part of, of, of targeting and, and, and going about creating that rate. We're going to maintain um, the, the, the usage block rate. So typically your rates have two components, as you are aware, the meter based component, which is the fixed and the com component that's charged to make service available. And then the volumetric, which is charged based on the amount of water service you use. So for this rate, it, we're going to go about maintaining the fixed component, but for the flow component, uh, we're going to target the outside water commercial rate, and we're going to maintain the existing four blocks, but then we're going to add a fifth block at somewhat of a a, a, a reduced rate. The fifth block will, will represent approximately usage at, at and over 300,000 gallons per day. And the economic development initiative and target will go about um, promoting economic development and incentivizing those high use customers uh, to come to the city of Columbia uh, based on this rate, okay? So scenario one, as we're showing it, only applies to the high use water rate service. And there'll be no adjustments to the existing sewer rate structure. So we'll maintain the sewer rate structure, maintain the, the, the meter base structure on the water side, but then make an adjustment to the volumetric uh, component. What do the existing rates look like? So for example, we're simulating a six inch customer uh, and for outside water service, that meter rate would be about $346 uh, per month based on the meter size. And then we have the block rates here for commercial outside service. So we have block one, two, three, four. And in this scenario, we're going to add a fifth block. So going into more details as it relates to the high use water rate. So this is the rate um, in, 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 in essence or at its core. Your existing rate um, for block, okay, so let me just go back a step. So for block one through four, you have usage, which is zero to three CCFs, which is block one. Then over three CCFs to 100 CCF is block two. Over 100 CCF to 1,000 um, is block three and all usage over a thousand uh, is, is block four. In the case of this high use rate, we're going to go about adding a, a fifth block. And, and based on cost of service as highlighted and based on your existing rates, we're going to maintain blocks two, three, and four. 
and then we're going to go about adding a fifth block at a, a lower rate in order to promote economic development. Uh, and as you can see, the scenario line 20 and 21 says the total uh, simulation of revenues uh, on, on a monthly basis based on cost of service. And you can see the differences herein. So this becomes the structure of the high use water rate. Um, let me stop here to see if there are any questions as it relates to this, this rate. Uh, I know we said a lot. Um, so any questions? Uh, didn't, hadn't we already approved this rate? I think, I think we're talking about uh, as a matter of policy prospectively, how we're going forward. Uh, is that where? Yes, so we, we, we've presented this in the past. And I don't think there was a request for action. It was informing you of the direction. Um, but no, I know the team and staff is coming back um, to inform again and request action. Well, action Robert, that, that's took, correct. That, I'm sorry, Councilman DeRaw. We, we took it, for, didn't we do this for Project Sunshine or was that a one-off and you, now you want to put it into uh, available for anybody? So, Councilman, we we briefed y'all and y'all approved the concept, and we were going to formally do that with this year's rate ordinance revision because Project Sunshine's not using water or sewer yet. So we knew we had the time to do that and amend the rate ordinance okay. this one time. So th this is the official action of what you've already seen. Robert was just going back over that, refreshing your memory. But this is the deal that we agreed to to incentivize your sunshine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is correct. So we, we need to do this because they got a whole lot of concrete out there expecting it. <laughs> yes, sir. And then we don't have any other customer right now that would fall into that category. So the delay really didn't impact anything other than, you know, we had the, the, the commitment before, but this is formalizing that. Right. But it, but it would extend to other high use. Yeah, yes, ma'am. If we have another project, Sunshine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. It absolutely would. <coughs> All right. Good deal. Okay. So moving on to your miscellaneous. Hello, can you, can you, I, I got a quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. Y yes, sir. Hey, uh, Clint, so how many more Project Sunshines can we take on before all facility upgrade, the, the expensive facility upgrades would have to be made at wastewater or water? It's a great question, sir. It, it depends on where they would be located. Um, we, we know that uh, another Project Sunshine or two out in Pineview would create some challenges from a water distribution standpoint, but because of the proximity to the wastewater collection uh, system and, and treatment plant, we're in good shape there to convey the waste and treat the waste. Um, the, so, so we're in better shape at that location on the wastewater side than we are on the, the water provision side. Um, in the northeast the industrial part that the county is looking to develop near Blythewood, we're in fantastic shape on the water distribution side because we have a 48-inch water main that traverses that park or that property. Um, but we're not as in a, as good a shape on the wastewater provision side because it's so far away from our waste treatment plant. So that we can absorb them from a total capacity standpoint, but a lot of planning has to go into where to site those industries and how much uh, a heavy intensive wet industry needs and, and where they would go. So uh, that's a long answer and I apologize for not being more direct, but that's about as best I can do for you. No, I appreciate that. And I mean, as we treat the, the, the stormwater, wastewater, I guess it's going to be wastewater. I mean, are we going to hit DHEC standards pretty quickly uh, with, with what we're allowed to put into to the, the river shed? Well, so we, we've got, from a hydraulic capacity standpoint, we've got um, a 60 million gallon a day rated facility, and we average about 36 million gallons a day um, discharge to the Congaree River. So we've got a good bit of hydraulic capacity we just went through an aeration upgrade that's going to increase our biological treatment capacity so that um, we can handle more poundage. Um, we do know eventually we will have to upgrade our waste treatment facility, both hydraulically and from a treatment standpoint. But um, we've got a good bit of capacity from a, a, a poundage loading and also hydraulic left. 
Um, we also impose and are very strict about our um, about our surcharges, and so we don't let a customer um, just just dump a, a whole lot of uh, high strength waste on us. If they go above a certain value, then they have to pay a, a penalty for that, which helps fund future upgrades in terms of biological or, or loading capacity. All right, thank you. Robert? Okay. So moving on to miscellaneous service fees. So what we wanted to, to, to highlight here is the fact that um, staff undertook an evaluation just to refresh and understand, you know, the costs associated with providing these services. Um, and as a result of understanding those costs, are the existing fees that you charge, you know, adequate? So what, what are miscellaneous fees? They're, they're service charges slash user fees um, that are levied upon customers for a specific good or service for the use of, of, of public facilities. So in the case of Columbia Water, these aren't direct water and sewer user charges, but there are other services you all provide, insulation services, turn and turn off services, for example, and these fees support these services because <laughs> as you're aware, if you have a turn on or off, if somebody calls, somebody has to take that call, somebody has to react and somebody has to sort um, that customer's need and requirement in short order. And what these charges do is try to understand the cost to provide those services, price them as such, okay? So in, in doing so, staff looked at uh, a, a few of the services or all the services that you provided, and there were recommendations to make adjustments to some and to leave um, the remainder um, as they are. So for example, your current charge uh, for a fire hydrant installation is $800. The new recommendation is 1600. For hydrant meters is 240. Uh, the new recommendation is a thousand, um, but there's a credit of 700 if it's returned within um, three years. Say for example, meter replacements, um, you're currently charging $45 for like a three quarter inch to one inch, um, but we're proposing a, a, a $300 charge. Um, for some of the charges, there is no change. Say, for example, unauthorized use fees, straight connection fee, a lock meter fee, uh, a, a remove meter fee, all those charges, for example, will remain the same. So this is just a, a, a listing of the existing miscellaneous charges that were re reviewed uh, and the, the, the proposed uh, recommendations. So in closing and wrapping up, you know, what is, what is the ask? Um, the ask is to consider the implementation of the FY22 um, water and sewer slash Columbia water financial plan. Um, consider um, the implementation of the high use uh, water rate and consider the, the implementation uh, of the proposed miscellaneous service charges. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to present to you all today. And, you know, please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions for Robert? Yeah, I can't there. see that. I can't see all, all, all the hands. Uh, Mr. Duval. Uh, Robert and Clint both, uh, that, that, that was an excellent presentation. A very, a very, uh, a lot of information in there for the public and for the council to digest. Um, one of the things that I appreciated Robert covering was the value of water. Uh, we are blessed in the city of Columbia to have a great source of water with both the Lake Murray coming through the Saluda River uh, and the Broad River coming down the, from up, up in the uh, uh, northwest side of the state also. So we have abundant water, which a lot of people don't have. If you've been reading or hearing the news lately about the people out west, 
uh, it is getting to be critical and to the point where we may not, they might not, might even not be able to run the generators in some of the big dams that they have out there this year because the water levels are so low. So we, we are blessed to have uh, these water sources. I note on our water rate that we are still giving the first 300 uh, cubic feet at, at, at the same charge. No, no charge uh, for the first 300 cubic feet, which means that if, if you use the, th the 300 cubic feet, you'd have a, um, an increase of only 41 cents over the previous rate that we charge for that if we adopt the new rate. And people that use the water and sewer uh, at the, the first 300 uh, cubic feet, it's a dollar and 45 cents total. So, uh, and a, a lot of our people are, are under those term, those uh, numbers. Uh, I used to use five and 600 cubic feet uh, on McGregor. We don't, I don't use nearly that much in this apartment, but uh, water in Columbia is fairly priced and it is valuable because we have abundant sources. So I, I think we need to continue to fund these uh, water and sewer request that the staff has done uh, and keep the system running efficiently. Thank you, Mr. Duval. Any other questions for, for Robert or, or statements? Uh, Daniel. I just, I, I wrote down a bunch of questions um, going through this and, and I'd like to follow up at, a, at the appropriate time. Obviously, you know, today we got a full agenda, but um, at the appropriate time, I'd love to follow up with Robert. Uh, uh, and a little bit more to understand some of the, the dynamics there. Um, but I really appreciate what you put together. It's very comprehensive, but I'd like to um, schedule a time in the next couple of weeks, if we could, to, to go over these questions. Okay. 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 Sure. Certainly a couple of questions I had too, but also in the interest of time, I know we have a lengthy agenda. Um, I, I, I was off camera briefly, did we cover today, and usually you also show us a sensitivity analysis, looking at our population and the ability of, of, mm -hmm. of, of folks to pay. We didn't do that this time, right? I, I don't think no. I saw that one chart that's uh, been included uh, or maybe before or what have you. But I'd be curious if we have any numbers like uh, that, but I think 5% um, is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a win. Um, uh, going in the, in the, in the right uh, direction. I, I double down on everything Mr. Duval had to say as well, including I think, I think some of the sanitary compared to one of them. Um, so no, um, thanks for the comprehensive uh, report and, and recommendations, Robert. I always look forward to seeing you, yes. even virtually. <laughs> no problem, thank you all so very much. Thank All right. you. So, that's the manager, we're going to keep on going. Is that we're going, to, we're going to require action right now, or what are we, what are we looking for? No, sir. Um, it, it will be incorporated into the the budget recommendations. So we'll keep going for now. And, but that, and that includes the um, uh, the super user issue. We can handle that later. Doesn't need to be handled now. It does no, sir. I mean, we we're looking for you all to approve okay. it formally, yes, sir. But as okay. far as in the actual budget, um, okay. that the water and sewer fund will incorporate the five percent. No, I meant I meant the uh, the super user rate. I mean, that does not there's, there's time issues there. We, we're 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 good. Uh, I know they're they're moving forward pretty aggressively on construction. So right, kind of I, Clint and Missy, I guess uh -huh. when. We to the point of of the budget, um, the vote on the budget, are you incorporating a separate motion on the high user rate? Those would be part of the rate ordinance, um, Ms. Wilson. So as, okay. as the, the rate's adopted, then then that will be taken care of as well. And, and in terms of timing, the mayors, they, they are moving at uh, unbelievably aggressive pace and, um, and doing really, really well, but we, we got plenty of time still to approve for our normal budget process to get those right adjustments in place. Okay, super, super, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Clint, Robert. So at this time we'll move along so that we can
um, have enough time to get everything in the overview of um, the recently approved American Rescue Plan and some recommendations that we have for you all, Mayor and Council. And with that, Missy Kaufman, our Budget and Program Management Director, will start us off. Um, again, we're doing it in this order as so we're building you up to the um, budget budget recommendations by fund. I'd also add on the agenda, um, just for the sake of the public awareness, all of the funds will be covered today. I, I meant for them to be actually bulleted out on the agenda, um, but I it was in the memo that you received, as well as, um, I guess while Missy's setting this up, I would say there's been, as you know, many of you with all of your um, national contacts and colleagues um, through various um, organizations, you know that there is an abundance of information right now regarding funding, funding sources, um, the American Rescue Plan, obviously, and the direct allocation we've received as a city. And then there's also many opportunities through the Federal Appropriations Act. And so we're very, very thankful for Ralph um, and Deborah with Capital Edge, who, you know, have served us so well for many years. But I mean, we as a staff, our entire team, I mean, we are talking to them daily and we are staying ahead of these potential opportunities to have uh, funds for some projects in the city of Columbia and infrastructure. And so I didn't want to confuse you with everything we're presenting today, but Missy Gentry has done a phenomenal job of working with all of our different departments, along with um, obviously our finance team and our um, Wana and the lobbyists. And so we've already submitted for several um, projects to meet certain deadlines as far as sending things to um, the congressman and others. And so we have an email that outlines some of that for you. And I'm going to ask uh, me to go ahead and send that to you later today. We just wanted to get through the budget pr presentation so that you um, don't get confused with all the various sources. So with that, Missy's going to be, Kaufman's going to take you through now our proposed budget and start with the rescue plan recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. After following um, Mr. Sheely and uh, Robert Chambers, I feel like I really need to up my game here on the conversation. <laughs> so hopefully this uh, will, will continue a thread of good information and good discussion um, around this exciting opportunity for the city and our upcoming um, proposed budget or uh, your, your, your proposed budget. So the, the first part of the conversation when we want to talk about is just an overview of, our, of the presentation. We, will, we want to uh, remind City Council of the project of the budget timeline, um, uh, a summary of the American Rescue Plan as mentioned, as well as go through the proposed fiscal year 21-22 uh, city manager proposed budget. We'll cover each operating fund, which will be the general fund, our parking fund, our water and sewer operating fund, our stormwater operating fund, hospitality tax and accommodation tax. And then um, as has been discussed in a couple of council meetings, we, we thought we'd go ahead and bring um, forward um, an introduction about a special project that we're doing with uh, Bloomberg's What Works Cities and our City Budgeting for Equity and Recovery Initiative. So just some highlights from the, of, of the conversation, of course, you know, as, as we are still in an economic uncertainty uh, around the pandemic, there is, there is some silver linings, there are some um, <laughs> promising days ahead, so we, we, are, we are cautiously optimistic as we, as, um, as we have been proceeding. Uh, our continuity of operations and continuing to provide our excellent day-to-day -day services to our community. Um, our city departments have not missed a beat. We're continuing to provide services day to day um, and have been and look forward to the opening of parks here in a few weeks. Our park facilities uh, um, as summer is, is coming upon us. And of course, um, uh, as always, fulfilling our city's financial obligations. Uh, that's one of the most important things we feel like we can do as stewards of the city's funds and making sure that we maintain a healthy financial um, um, footprint for the city. So, um, and, and, and as we've been talking through many of these conversations and having lots of conversations, especially with our colleagues across the country, as we talk about the American Rescue Plan, as, as well as the impact of COVID, um, this was a reassounding 
um, statement of if you're going through hell to keep going, for Winston Churchill. <laughs> so we're just going to keep on going and keep trudging ahead and, and make our way through together. Just a reminder of our budget timeline. We're here today, as Ms. Wilson said, we've, we've compressed a, a, a usually a pretty um, lengthy budget conversation into today's conversation with the expectations that um, just as, uh, and you'll probably hear me say this several times today, following today's conversation, we will be advertising the budget this week in anticipation of a budget public hearing for May the 11th. This is it will be a special called meeting date, but will allow us an opportunity to get the budget um, approved in, and passed in May. Um, a, the, the advertisement date is based on state law in order to meet our 15 day notice requirements. So the um, notice will be sent out this week for advertisement next week. And then second reading and adoption will be May 18th. So all of the discussions with regards to our budget, both with our water and sewer discussions that Mr. Sheely and Robert Chambers just went through with, um, discuss with you, as well as the budget being proposed today, would all need to be advertised by this week to meet the schedule. American Rescue Plan. This is this will be a very high level um, conversation. Um, I'm by all means um, not a proficient or fluent um, spokesperson for the discussion of this plan, but have had many conversations and been on many um, webinars. We've had many discussions with uh, National League of Cities. U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, thanks for U.S. Conference of Mayors with some direct conversations with Treasury, as well as uh, ICMA, um, MASB, GFOA, um, all kinds of guidance and information out there um, coming forward. And of course, we can't forget our um, um, Capital Edge and all of the help and assistance that they give to us on anything at a national level um, and, and, and really appreciate all of their help and support in providing with us with information timely um, and definitely reliable um, and they're always a great advocate for the city and we appreciate their support. Uh, high level overview with regards to the American Rescue Plan, the first and foremost what we want to express and um, repeat is that guidance for local govern government um, financial assistance is still dependent from the U.S. Treasury. That is very key for these funds. Um, it is, it's like waiting on the federal registry when we receive any of our federal dollars. Um, it, will, it will determine for us how we, how we can use the funds as well as what any kind of reporting and requirements that we'll have. So it's very important that we, um, that we um, receive this guidance. Um, also, we know at this point that the city's estimated direct allocation to Columbia um, is 25.9 million. Um, this will be coming straight to the city of Columbia, unlike CARES Act funds last year that went through the state. We also are, uh, are, have been made aware that there's an additional 2.5 in our HUD home funds. Um, those are subject to the HUD requirements and the HUD, pro HUD program, but it is a, a direct allocation to the city, so we're, we're including it in this, this outline here. The local financial assistance. Um, funds, the 25.9 million, um, it's, the act requires that it be dispersed within 60 days from being signed into law, signed into law on March the 11th, so we anticipate getting this funds no later than May the 11th. By then, um, guidance from Treasury should have also been received um, or anticipated. Then the act requires that the second part of the payment be received no sooner than one year from the first. We have until December 31st. 2024 to spend these funds. That's specific to the, the direct allocation. HUD and home funds are, are under their own guidance and direction. They, they're not subject to the uh, Treasury guidance. Some of our other key takeaways that we have been, um, been receiving um, and, and sharing with our colleagues and, and, and other discussions, Treasury guidance bill is pending again can't um, overstate the, that their guidance is still is still um, pending and is important. Of course, we need Treasury um, to be provide us with eligible uses. Although there is outlined in the in the Act what is eligible, and what's really important and key to this part of the conversation is the administration of the funds. Um, that will be definitely um, a, a significant component of this process as well. Uh, other guidance is also is that we plan for the recovery. Um, 
underlying a, a lot of the use of these funds and recovery is anticipated to that we're returning people to work and then we're putting jobs back in place. Um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I think that's been a phrase that's been referred to on several of these conversations. I know that um, um, we all like to be able to move in the fast lane on these um, and so the structure and the organization, how we disperse and utilize these funds will be important. Um, because that's going to be the fastest and best, most efficient way to be able to deliver these funds um, where they are intended to go. And then with, the, with that, um, we are also advised um, to assess our needs and address our gaps um, and look specifically for those gaps, especially as we consider the local uh, recovery funds. These are the only funds that the city is receiving directly in the system. Um, and so we are advised to use gaps and priorities not for eligible um, other, other programs. As you'll see in the summer coming up, there is a lot of different programs in this act, a lot of different um, funding opportunities that cover a number of initiatives um, that the city council has expressed in our community. Um, so we uh, want to make sure that we are, are, are spreading our funds with, um, with a consideration of um, not duplicating efforts. And of course, we take time to uh, create, create a, a well-defined plan um, and with equity at its core. We're going to think strategically about how to use these funds for our future needs, not only today, but also building some resiliency. And then um, we are reminded these, that these funds are one time and we need to treat them as such so that if we're using them for one time, that, so that we're, as we're receiving them one time, that we use them for one time needs and one time um, expenditures. Um, we'll, we will be required to document and provide some regular reporting on the spending is what we are anticipating. We don't know what that yet looks like. Um, that also speaks to, of course, capacity um, for that program, but also to the eligible pieces um, will be important in terms of how those funds are received. As for the summary of the local government assistance, um, $360 million, that, that's really $350 million, billion, excuse me, I'm, I'm not used to um, referring to billion in our budget conversation um, with an additional 10 billion for coronavirus capital project funds. States are receiving the direct allocation. The city's allocation is based primarily on our HUD formulas with also a factor for um, poverty. So the city's allocation is based on that, that, um, that formula. The county is also receiving a direct allocation, I believe in the, na in the neighborhood of eight, 80 million. As far as the legislative uses that have been designated specifically under section 9901 of the ARP of the American Rescue Plan um, is responding to public health um, related to COVID and its negative impacts on both household assistance to households, small business, nonprofits, aid and impacted um, industries. Um, obviously speaking of tourism, travel and hospitality. Um, we also, um, <laughs> The, the act also addresses responding to workers with essential work related to um, public health and, and COVID-19. Um, there's also provision uh, for government services to the extent of the reduction of revenue. As that relates to the city of Columbia specifically, um, this means as, as it states here that local governments due to the COVID public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most, re most recent full fiscal year, the local government prior to the emergency for the city of Columbia, that means fiscal year 1819. You'll see in our coming conversations that fiscal year 1819 is our foundation or for basis for our recommendations uh, with regards to revenue. Um, to make investments um, in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure, as well as transfer funds to private nonprofits that are, are designated in the Kenner Venti Homeless Act um, recipients. Funds cannot be used for pension and they cannot be used to offset a tax increase. With that guidance that was presented there, this is where the city has, as uh, city manager has put together a proposed use of those um, American Rescue Plans and Ms. Wilson, and I'm sure you'll want to jump in at any point in time for these conversations. As mentioned, our basis for these allocations are, are, are being driven from um, our fiscal year 18-19 revenues. Um, one of the first Stated uses is regards to the recovery SE, the jet loan that the city received, um, has, has, has received. Um, our, our recommendation is to, is 
to basically return that loan um, and pay for the funds that we have, have are obligated to refund and restore. That has a long-term impact in the sense that the um, the use of those funds would would incur is, is a loan. It's a it would be a debt onto um, the fund that would be the recipient of those funds. So if it was general fund, it would be debt on the general fund um, um, going forward. So we we are recommending that we pay those funds back in place of using these funds. Revenue shortfall, as mentioned, um, we used our fiscal year 18-19 um, as, a, as a baseline and determined where there are shortfalls. There is still guidance pending from the um, Treasury, of course, as we've mentioned, I think, a couple of times uh, now. <laughs> so the guidance is still pending in terms of, 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 how, of what the revenue um, recovery would look like in our conversations with, with um, other entities and with um, um, some of the other organizations that we've mentioned, uh, we're looking at things that both a, a line item of a revenue stream as well as a, a category of a revenue stream. So we have programmed these funds into our upcoming budget. Um, revenue shortfalls both in the general fund, our parking fund and our hospitality specifically. Um, by far, parking fund has seen the most dramatic impact with regards to um, uh, parking revenues. Uh, and we state that based on um, both projections, but also actual revenues received. And we'll get into that a little bit further as we get through this conversation. Um, the city manager is also um, including a provision for um, employee hazard and premium pay um, to be discussed um, um, as we move forward. And then not in any specific order or our designated amounts because as we are still pending the uh, guidance from Treasury um, and then listening to city councils, specific conversations and in reference in, in prior meetings where some per certain areas have come up um, with regards to um, external uses um, or even internal uses just on specific programs administered maybe through the city. Uh, affordable, affordable housing initiatives, um, nonprofit assistance, small business support, broadband, and food insecurity. And as we think of those lists and consider those, um, uh, keep in mind we will go forward with discussions on some of the other programs and allocations that also will be addressing some of these same areas. So we want to be cognizant of um, duplication of, of the effort. I'm going to pause there to see if there's any comments. I know I'm kind of rapid fire discussion here so, so Missy, sure we're not Missy thank you for getting us to this point obviously this gets you know to the crux of, of the funding and quite frankly um, you know between Missy and Jeff and I and working with the ACMs and, and our finance team I mean the numbers just really are what they are when you back into um, the debt repayment and the revenue shortfall. You know, the only thing that we, we I guess, played with a little bit was this idea of, of premium pay. And it's called, the, the premium pay is taken from the terminology used in the act itself. So um, those numbers are truly based off um, the formulas that we were given to work from. Um, from FY 1819 being the baseline. And so I did not want to take any liberties other than knowing various categories of external uses that I knew you all were interested in. Really wanted feedback from you on, you know, how you would um, seek to prioritize some of those areas with the um, $6.5 million remaining um, to to use to assist in those areas. And again, uh, you know, we can't reiterate enough, and this is coming from Ralph and all the national sources. There's just, the treasury guidance is, is really key here. This is different than the, when obviously mm -hmm. you all were very forward thinking and we were able to put some programs together internally for external use. Obviously those are city funds. These are federal dollars and we're going to have to follow in um, the, the guidance as it comes out as to how um, it's utilized and how we comply with it going Teresa, forward. 
Teresa, I know you probably have a good number of questions. I'll go to Tamika first and then uh, Howard. But before we do that, in case one of these goes to pull some numbers up, sure. let me get my wrapped around our entire parking fund budget. And particularly, I'm interested in um, if, in fact, we're able, unable, think perfect, um, uh, well, we'll know the budget. Um, yes, we, we, we talk, are we at, are we at risk of not being able to meet our, our, our debt obligations on our, on, our, on our revenue bonds on the, I mean, what, what's the, um, impact uh, on, on that? Because obviously if, if it's, um, if, if that's the issue, um, um, um backing up our, our, our long-term debt obligations, then. I, there's no hesitancy to pushing that much into the parking fund. If that's not at risk, however, uh, I'd, I'd probably lean in, in the direction of some of the other issues towards the bottom of the list. But, but nonetheless, I, I'm curious about um, what, what's the what's the overall parking fund budget? I'm trying to remember. Is it nine nine million thereabouts or, uh, annually? Yes. You want to jump to that because I do think that's illustrative for. Um, council's understanding. You want to just jump to the parking fund budget and go ahead yep. and address it. Yes, ma'am. Sure will. And I'm sorry, y'all have to get off, off track. No, but. I mean we're going to have to get there anyway. Yeah. We we talked about this, Mayor, because it's yeah. this is a different kind of budget. We're trying to fill in gaps and explain why yeah. and then go to the actual fund. But yes, sir, we can go to it right. Well, the, the, the primary question was, was uh, I knew it was about a nine million dollar budget. Mm -hmm. Was how does how does the the filling this gap or failure to fill this gap how does it affect our, 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 our bondholders uh, or, or what have you? And if that's not at risk, we need to have more discussion around that. But go, go ahead, Missy. Um, this is Jeff. So yeah. yes, we are under risk we have issues covering meeting our bond covenants and parking i believe this will be showing you the parking budget i don't know if it shows kind of the actuals through this year we'll have to look and we can put information back out there but this past year and in the current year we're not anticipating meeting bond covenants because we are not generating the revenue that we need to cover our operational costs um, we're hopeful that we can utilize these revenues to, uh, and, and all we're looking to do is get it back to the 2019 levels. That will still keep things kind of close, but that will be where we'll go back to our bond council and others to talk about how that's going to affect the covenants and what the requirements on the system are. If we don't do this, we will end up having to have a parking study and that will potentially push us to have to have parking rates increased across the board. Um, but that would only be going forward. Um, it, it really doesn't um, help in the current year um, and potentially the next year. I will point out, so the numbers that Missy Kaufman is going to show you and has on that spreadsheet for parking for the ARP funds that he used, those numbers are estimates. Um, so if we don't end up utilizing all of those funds, we do have to 2024 to utilize these. So if parking comes in and if 2.3 million isn't neat. I, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but if the number for next year isn't neat, it's a smaller number. We'll have additional funds that we can roll back in that can be used for the other uh, uses as designated once we get guidance from Treasury and approval from y'all. Does that answer your question there? And I was hopeful that the fund summary was going to be it's, it's 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 helpful, and then we got we got to wait for. Uh, treasury guidance and 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 the like, uh, but just with you know with the um, significant needs of our our H tax funded organizations, our cultural uh, institutions, obviously um, whatever we can do in terms of broadband, affordable housing, you know, small businesses, uh, obviously there's there's a whole lot out there, and and unless, I mean, I, I, I a little bit of discomfort of of a, a third of the of, of the committed funding going to to, to parking. Um, but we'll talk some more about that as we as we learn as we go along. Um, Ms. Devine? Yeah, it's still here. Yeah. I just, um, uh, <laughs> Missy, can you go back? Uh, sure, yeah, you question while she's going back. Gotcha. So just want to make sure. So um, basically, we're working with a balance of $6.5 million for the external uses. Um, seeing as the money will be split in half, um, have y'all thought through a process of 
um, sorry, have y'all thought through a process of um, when, you know, how much would be available at what time? So we're, we're y'all are looking at the allocation, but only half will be available now and another half won't be for another year. Yes, ma'am, we are taking that into consideration and also would, would be also reminding city council of that same in terms of how we allocate, um, especially as we need guidance from treasury in terms of how the funds, uh, you know, they, they have a year to give us those funds, but if we don't receive those funds between um, by June 30th of the following year, then that could have some longer term, you know, impacts uh, with regards to our financial statements. But we are taking that into consideration. Um, some of the city uses, you know, maybe, um, especially if we're talking about the, the current budget, um, versus those things that are based on prior years showing up our, our, our prior years. Okay. Um, and, you know, I've, I've told everybody I've spoken to 25 million sounds like a lot of money, but in the scheme of things, it's not. And I think, of course, looking at where we have internal needs and in, in this, it, it really elevates the fact that it's really not a lot of money and goes very fast. Um, I would, you know, definitely uh, suggest that as we look at the external um, allocations, uh, consider um, not just a, an official process, but maybe a, pro a part of that process be some input um, from the community on, on some of the priorities. I know um, several people have already done that. So um, if we could maybe look at that as well. And then the last thing I would suggest is um, so that our money goes as far as possible. I certainly would suggest that we uh, look at, and I know that our, well, I won't say no. Um, I imagine that our process, because um, we are used to this, is, is probably, um, even though we're still waiting on, on Treasury guidance, is, is probably going to be a little bit more defined and official because we uh, typically do this. Um, but I would suggest if we could um, maybe seek um, some kind of uh, collaboration with the county in some areas, for instance, they are already doing the rental assistance. Um, so certainly, although we could do something similar, there, there really isn't, we don't need to be duplicating efforts. Um, but if we are looking at gaps, um, figuring out where the gaps within our community, particularly the city are, um, so that as we're allocating funds, if the county is doing something, uh, we don't duplicate that effort, but we also talk to our partners on the county uh, to ensure that city residents get um, fair uh, access to those funds, although they live in the incorporated area. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Bond. And we have, um, we, there are a few different um, surveys that are out there as well, you know, between um, uh, uh, Economic Development Office of Business Opportunity has done some surveys. Community Development, of, of course, is doing surveys, especially related to the HUD funds. So we, we have a number of input methods that have already occurred that that could be useful um, for that for that for that guidance as you mentioned but that is important in terms of assessing gaps and you're right the the whole need to not to spread our funds according to gaps where there aren't our available uses is, is key to this discussion mm -hmm. so and Ms. Day, we've got some input as well i'll share with you i know howard will and i spoke at a neighborhood meeting and afterwards I got a, a very lengthy email from the community. Apparently after we left, they, they did talk about what they'd like to see. So I will forward that and I've gotten some um, from others. I would also encourage us to look at, I mean, there are several uh, very well-organized grassroots nonprofits who are doing great work in the community that aren't always weren't always on our radar and have never been part of our system of getting community promotions or anything else. And so I, I certainly would want us to get input from them because they are dealing with things every day in the community and they know where some of the gaps and some of the needs are. So we uh, could work with them, not just to get the money into the community, hey, but also to make sure that, um, that they are part of the process too. All right. Yes, All right, Ms. Mr. Duvall. And then uh, Mr. Davis, then Mr. Rickman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a lot of my questions were answered when you discussed the parking fund because I was looking at the hospitality fund. Uh, there again, those funds are gonna be split in, into two years. 
uh, my, my thought on the hospitality was to try to get as much money as we could back into the organizations uh, by using the H tax <clears throat> funds out of the ARP as a backstop. Hopefully the, the collections of the H tax itself are gonna be going up. Uh, and I think they might've gone up a little bit more than we had anticipated. We might've collected more than we'd anticipated this year. Um, so I, I think the, the question is how much of, of this can be used um, to shore up the H tax rather than a direct expenditure uh, on projects in the H tax. And so, um, could you ask that again? You're asking if it was d direct expenses or the revenue. We were treating it as the revenue as a as basically a transfer in. That's part of the guidance that we're still taking from Treasury in terms of what we've discussed. And would we be treating it as a it's important in terms of how the financials would be, how it ends up being recorded if we're able to treat it as a grant so that we can transfer it into the fund and then it's a funding use of that system, if you will. Would you use half of that 4.8 million in, in the budget year that we're talking about now, 21-22? So what we have included in the fiscal year 21-22 for our age tax is the 1.7 for this year. Um, the other amounts are already in the funds that we would basically be helping to show up where the, the forecast of where we are today in this year's fund and then of course the prior year. So it's basically building a reserve. Okay. And it may help say, when we get to the eight on Mr. Duvall, um, obviously. Okay. I mean, I, we understand where, you know, where you are and, and what you all want to do with shoring up for the groups. I think we're trying to strike a balance as to getting, making sure the fund is healthy in the years ahead as well as, you know, your ability potentially in the years ahead to do some of the things you had mentioned you wanted to do pre-COVID, whether it is an tax bond, um, et cetera, so. Okay. All right, uh, Sam and Daniel. Sam, you're on mute. <laughs> but we can read your lips. Sorry about that. My my, uh, my my suggestions aren't too different from what I'm hearing now. Um, even if we partner with folks, some of it we could maybe use a seed dollars for those areas where we may not have enough to do what we want to do anyway, but we could help uh, those organizations that um, that are pretty much trying to do some of the things that we'd like to do and can't do. The other thing is um, I'm, I'm hoping we can do as much as we can um, in partnering with or helping to support small business initiatives uh, citywide. Uh, but then, you know, to be honest with you, there's some areas where we probably would benefit if we really target to help small businesses trying to either get off the ground or small businesses tr just trying to grow and maintain. That's all. Okay, Mr. Um, you know, I think everything everybody said is is worthwhile for the discussion, but uh, I feel like we really need to look towards and and I would look to Miss Wilson and, and the staff. We we we've got equipment needs, we've got shot spotter expansion needs, we've got all these internal needs that we need to take care of, and I think we need to to focus it inwards um, as much as we can and take care of these needs to make sure that our staff and and all of our services are being delivered because they're based on citywide needs and um, services and I think we ought to look to see what else we need internally first before we go out there's a lot of recovery money out there for all types of 
businesses and uh, nonprofits and everybody else uh, through other grant opportunities. I do think we need to look internally first and I, I'd like to see some more recommendations from staff on what we could use these funds for as we get more information. Yes, sir. Right. Um, um, happy to do that. And um, no, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, and, and again, my um, my most significant concern is obviously we, we have we 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 run a, a tight ship, and I'm I'm thankful of the work our staff does. Uh, this does also represent a a significant um, maybe a historic opportunity to make some really strong moves in some ways that matter. I agree with Tamika. There's a whole lot of great grassroots work going on out there. If we can support that in the interest of our citizens, we need to do that. Um, but the two um, particular areas stand out to me that we have an opportunity to make strides here. And that's in, in, in working with our, our, our public partners and our nonprofit and for-profit partners for that matter in delivering broadband uh, to, to people of, of this community. Uh, the digital divide is real. We saw it. And, um, um, in more ways, uh, from education to, to, to healthcare, to just economic stability more than we ever have. And then um, uh, obviously affordable housing um, affecting every community um, across this country. And, but Columbia is our, our primary concern that this represents an opportunity uh, to really stand up some long-term efforts uh, in the interest of posterity and economic prosperity in those spaces, those stand out to me. And I, and I, I, I raised the issue of, of, of age tax. I'm speaking specifically um, about, um, about getting monies to these arts organizations that have, have weathered the storm um, significantly, not necessarily had the opportunity to participate as much in some of the efforts we stood up collectively as a group uh, last year. Uh, some of them are, are, are hanging by a thread. I think it's important for us uh, to try and... Um, and, and support those organizations and make sure they're able to weather the storm as well. Um, so we'll, we'll all have more opportunities to discuss them, but I, I wanted to continue to lift up uh, those in, in particular, broadband, affordable housing, and, and uh, working with our age tax organizations, getting them um, up and strong and running again as the economy comes back. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir, Mr. McDowell. Yes, I, uh, I, don't, I certainly don't want to beat the drum but I'm going to beat it because I've been beating it continuously. Um, I think the services and whatever we do has to be, it has to be driven uh, with a human consciousness that is appropriate to whatever that cause is. Um, I've, got a, I've got an issue with firefighters' equipment. Uh, I keep harping on that because there are firefighters that are in, in need of new equipment. And um, I would certainly hope, and we, I may certainly be off the beaten path, but of course, I think it's necessary that if we're going to do anything, it has to be, it has to be driven with a kind of human consensus. And um, these firefighters need this equipment rate of cancer uh, relative to firefighters equipment is very, very important. And I keep raising that issue. issue. But I think the, a large part of that has to be with that human dimension that uh, if we're going to do anything, it has to be human driven, human dynamics driven. I'm sorry. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. I think we're um. Let's so, just keep keep moving. And, um, yes, sir. We will. And I guess as we move into the more specific um, discussion of the funds, just recognize that the budget's in balance by utilizing these proposed. Um, numbers here, it, particularly as it comes to the general fund, the parking fund, the hospitality tax. So just keep that in mind. You know, I, I hear you loud and clear about wanting um, all the guidance we can give and, and surveys and getting seeking input from the public on the external uses of the 6.5.
if this is the breakout that you agree to, um, obviously I can always tell you other ways to use that internally. I did not want to assume nor come to you with a, a recommendation that only um, use the funds internally. So this was about the best we could get to. And again, it's, it's truly based off trying to um, get our budget back at, at a minimum to the way it, it was and hope for some redundancy, some sustainability, and just quite frankly, a little cushion um, going into those fiscal years, 22, 23, et cetera. So you did, you well, guys exactly, exactly what, what you needed to do. Um, okay. no, that, no, this is exactly where we need to start. And okay. uh, I mean, so no, you're, you're on point. And I think we, we're going to have to figure out as we give you positive, meaningful input and ask some of the important questions. There'll be some places here. I'm sure there'll be some opportunities for movement and some that just won't be. Uh, oh. But but we, I think we just need to throw back very specific recommendations as of what we might want to see more or less of. But you, know, you guys did a great job pulling this together. Okay. Yes, sir. So, Missy, why don't you um, try to, you know, expedite some of these additional slides now that I think the council has a flavor for what what our basis is. Okay, I'll put on the uh, fire hose uh, method here. So, okay, the next few slides are really just some summaries of the ARP and bringing to attention um, some areas of interest. Um, there's several other um, programs that aren't highlighted here, but these we know would be of interest. There's $10 billion in the in for um, local the local government assistance that for capital projects. It's specifically related to broadband. So this is also addressing our uh, broadband needs. Um, rental housing, there's various components related to rental housing, emergency rental assistance, as mentioned, Richland County is receiving 12.5 and then another 9.5 coming, as well as some other funds that are, aren't listed here specifically. Um, as Ms. Devine mentioned, in terms of coordinating with the county um, on these funds. Also, um, in, in mentioning too, some of these programs coming up, some are either going straight to the state or other um, or other agencies, but they are definitely funds that will be coming into our community um, in a variety of fashions. So we want to make sure we're staying staying aware and abreast of how they are being utilized within our community. So the emergency housing voucher um, through HUD, um, and also some additional funding for housing uh, counseling. Many of these programs we're all aware of and familiar with. Um, the city's the the home funds that will be coming through the HUD as mentioned. Those will be 2.5 million um, dollars. Uh, these actually have a, a use time of, of fiscal year 2025, so it's a little longer date. Uh, it does have a little different um, direction than our normal home funds, but I'm sure Ms. Saheed and her team will be able to address those as that as that moves forward. Uh, homeowner assistance program also an allocation start going straight to the state, uh, 9.9 .9 billion. An additional rat rental and housing assistance. This is specifically related to water um, assistance program. This, these funds will go to health and human services, $500 million. This will be helping specifically individuals with their water and use bills. Um, these are not funds the city has access to, but of course it's funds that our customers would have access to um, as well. Um, of course, we can't forget the relief to individuals and families. Um, individuals we will be receiving uh, $1,400 per taxpayer and an additional $1,400 per dependent, as well as also child tax credits that will be coming through um, in various outlines related to the child tax credit, um, additional paid and sick leave. Um, this is also will be helpful for, that's also uh, helpful for small business support with relation to the family and sick uh, um, family um, paid sick and medical leave, as well as the um, unemployment relief. Um, and, and nonprofits will be able to participate in that program as well. Transportation, the airport um, provisions, as well as FTA, um, understanding that the CMRTA is also receiving some additional portion of these funds. So, again, Funds that are coming into the community that the, the city doesn't necessarily um, involve with, but they are coming to our community. 
Uh, FEMA disaster and disaster assistance, the city does participate in some of these programs as well. As mentioned, some of these programs are available to the city by way of competitive grants. So that some of the FEMA grants will be competitive. Um, disaster assistance, um, funeral assistance for individuals, uh, the firefighter uh, grants and safer firefighter hiring grants. The city does um, has participated in both of these programs. I'm sure we would take advantage of the same opportunity um, with a competitive grant and then emergency management performance grant. Nutrition programs, SNAP, WIC, um, um, EDP uh, as well. So there's also nutrition programs. There's also a variety of programs that are assisting food banks um, and food provisions that will be addressing the different food insecurities in our community directly as well that do not come directly to the city, but will be the feed by several of the organizations that the city has partnered with on some food insecurity projects. Um, as mentioned, this mean the commodity supplemental food program that's specifically related to senior nutrition, nutrition um, the emergency food shelter, and then the uh, USDA child and adult care programs, um, which is also assisting um, for food provisions for, um, emergency, for those that are in uh, ha uh, housing shelters. Um, next, there's also the arts, humanities, museums, and libraries. These are also funds going directly to the state that will be assisting the arts organizations, that will be ass assisting the humanities organizations, um, so then also two that will be assisting libraries and museums. So I know those are also of interest to our, our council um, and to our community. Um, that, again, that's a high level overview um, and by far is not, is not comprehensive, but certainly areas of interest to our to our community and to our council. Would you, would you go back one slide, Missy? Certainly. So some of the national programs, oh, um, obviously these are, um, this money goes to the state and, and as it says here, uh, competitive grants. Are there some efforts that we can stand up to maybe help some of our local organizations participate in that and maybe in lieu of H tax dollars? I, I think that's a, a great approach so we have talked about that with regards to, you know, we did a um, coalition last year with um, Nine Way and, and Central Carolina Community Foundation for establishing, helping to assess some capacity of some of these organizations to seek these dollars, similar to the way our OBO does with assisting small business take advantage. Mm -hmm. I think there are some infrastructure in place. Together, SC has done some work in this area. We can certainly um, look, I know they have done a survey of nonprofits. We can certainly um, look into that a little bit further to see it would be a um, valuable opportunity for these organizations to be able to apply for these funds, but also making sure that they're, they're submitting, you know, strong application um, for this. What's not listed here is the shuttered venue um, grant. That's also out there and is available. I know that is also being shared among our, a number of our nonprofits that normally would take advantage of the hospitality tax grants as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, development of our budget, just as mentioned, you know, the, the city manager's focus is always is continuing our operations, especially as we were, you know, a year ago when we were faced with this, we were uncertain, um, still some uncertainties, but um, have, have, have um, seen some progress and look forward uh, to a, a, a brighter future, continuing our, to provide our day-to-day uh, -day services and fulfilling our financial obligations which is, as mentioned, all of these are, are underlining um, guiding principles to approach for uses of the amount of the American Rescue Plan funds in terms of how they would support the city, not just today, but also helping strengthen us um, for our, um, 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 for, for future and resiliency. R budget drivers, we know more than we did last year. Our department's budgets um, were um, submitted this year, they were given the same guidance. Um, if you recall, as we've had in, uh, some recent com budget conversations, departments were asked to prepare their budgets within using the same allocation they had the current year. Um, their current year budget was based on their FY, the fiscal year 18 19 actuals. So, as of today, that means these are um, budgets that are using uh, two year old financial information um, to build out going forward. Um, coming into three years by the time we end this coming fiscal year. There are some adjustments and we'll get to those as we move forward. Um, personal budgets were, were pretty much left as they were um, with some adjustments for um, uh, positions um, and moving forward. 
And of course, we are holding current service levels and maintaining existing programs, not really um, looking at any expanded or new programs, but being able to provide the services that we have. We did have a very compressed but a focused budget process. Um, we've asked farmers to think about how they have gained efficiencies and, and um, how they are able to deliver services from altered work arrangements. Um, we also made sure we were trying to capture some shortfalls and gaps in services and being able to prioritize those. Um, the budget is built around some of those prioritized areas. Um, as Sheely went through already with regards to water and sewer and stormwater. And of course, focusing on priority, uh, maintaining our service delivery. Um, and we are continuing to monitor and are, are anticipating or prepared to amend our budget in the coming months as we have more information um, available to us. Our total proposed budget is $376 million. That's a, about a $20 million increase over the current year um, from where we are today. The majority of that coming from um, our ARP funds, but also our water and sewer funds. Um, the general fund is $155 million with stormwater. I mean, our water and sewer actually now being our leading budget of $182 million, um, being now our largest budget. Of course, rounding that up, um, our enterprise funds can include water, our water and sewer fund, our, our stormwater fund, and our parking fund. Um, and then our rounding our special revenues would be uh, hospitality tax and accommodations tax. These together make up our operating budgets of the city. General fund revenues, um, we did see some progress or some good, um, some hopeful um, information with regards to our revenues. Um, our total budget is $155 million proposed for the city for the general fund. This is an increase of $18 million, or roughly 13%. Um, from the revenue perspective, that's $3.3 million, or 2.6% over the current year budget. Um, and I'm, I want to stress again, that's over current year budget. If we, I, um, if you refer to the packet of information that was uh, attached on your agenda with regards to the budget memos, um, our overall budget revenues um, are still below, coming in lower than where we were pre-pandemic, but definitely um, progressing better than we we were thinking we would be um, a year a, a year ago when we were looking at this situation. Our property tax and lost revenues are actually coming in better than expected, but business licenses and franchise, what we do know um, is that they are they still seem to be um, below where they should be at this time, but still unknown as both business license and franchise fees are not due. Um, business license fees have just been, are still coming in. Franchise fees, um, we do get some indications, but those are not coming in. Those don't come in until typically June. So it really will be um, the end of the fiscal year before we really know how we are, are ending this ending this year, um, both with regards to revenues and our expenditures. Uh, the majority of our increase in the budget really is coming from these transfers in. One thing that has been, we'll talk about this as we get on to the next slide with regards to expenditures, um, but we uh, were able to incorporate into the general fund a return of our capital lease program, as you recall. That was one of the primary expenses that we suspended in the current fiscal year. Um, this program is what we use to replace and replenish our um, rolling stock, primarily in the general fund. Um, that's a key, and that is a that's a, a a major initiative to be able to return back to the city's budget and back to operations. Um, our I'm sure our operating departments will be much relieved to see us be able to go back to that replacement schedule. Um, we have incorporated into this budget um, 1.6 million from American Rescue Plan. Um, we brought to you in our last conversation, we reviewed um, the installment purchase revenue bond um, proceeds. Um, there's a number of initiatives that are included in the installment purchase revenue bond that's been discussed with you. Um, the, the items that specifically have a budgetary impact are reflected in the budget and that would be this um, we have incorporated funds for the implementation and first year support of the security camera upgrades, the much anticipated security camera upgrades. Um, very excited to see that process moving forward. We've also restored the uh, transfer from the hospitality tax um, uh, to 3.7 million um, as well. Um, combined of these funds, this is what is able to support uh, our ability to be able to return the capital lease program. On the expenditure side, um, as mentioned, um, budgets remain re relatively 
taxes flat from the current fiscal year and they're using 18, 19 as a, actuals as their baseline. Um, where there are increases, those were basically um, increases outside of personnel, um, what personnel adjustments um, would be increasing. It would be due to um, annual contract adjustments and schedules. Um, for instance, our, our Microsoft um, Enterprise License um, that's in the IT budget along with some additional cloud solution software that was added to help us with the, um, a lot of the ability to be able to operate virtually. But also our, our emergency communications, our CAD system had an upgrade that we feel we're in on city council's approval. Um, that will have a, um, some, and, some, and also some schedule replacements that are uh, requested there. The citywide election is also reflected in the budget. That's a um, one-time expense that um, obviously it fluctuates as there is an, an election. Um, our recycling contract has been brought up. That's a significant re increase of $250,000 in the budget. It's been, it has been an expense in this year at that amount, but, 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 the, but it has not been reflected in the budget at that amount. So the budget now reflects that contract um, full cost. That has been a growing increase to cost um, as we are moving forward with our recycling. That's a, indicative of the industry um, and not something unique to Columbia. There's also funding that we need to incorporate into the department's budget um, for a rate increase for retirement system increases that we expected as well. What's not listed here is um, the capital lease that was um, also mentioned. Um, I thought to mention, put it here on the slide, but the capital lease program that, that's listed, um, as mentioned, that the, the replacement program, um, we are, with the $9 million, some of the equipment that would be purchased would be a, a new ladder truck or a, a much needed replacement ladder truck, um, a fire engine, as well as our patrol cars, um, garbage trucks and other uh, equipment, um, bucket trucks, other heavy equipment, as well as some of the replacement rolling stock for our, our general fund department. Moving on to water and sewer, I won't spend a lot of time here since a lot of that's been covered. The total budget is 182 million with an increase of 13.8 or 8%. Um, it does incorporate the 5%, 5.02% rate increase as presented. Some of those revenues are also coming from the Project Sunshine. It does allow us to maintain our 2.0 debt coverage, um, which is um, a, a, a longstanding target of, of the city for our financial um, strength. Water and sewer fund expenditures. Uh, that rate study um, or the rate increase and those uh, projected revenues uh, help to support a 120 million capital improvement program. As you recall, that was the stated goal for our capital improvement program for a number of years was to be able to do 120 every year with regards to our improvement with 40 million for water um, improvements and 80 million for wastewater improvements. It utilizes 16 million in cash from the system or remaining coming from, um, or, or those would be budgeted cash reserves remaining being bonds and pro other proceeds. Of course, the um, rate increase also covers the debt service for those bonds um, and our debt service schedule um, now is at 42.9 million. That's collective of all the active debt um, on, the, on the system and, and kind of and, and reflect 24% of the budget. And then we have also, we've retained the, the um, general fund transfer at the same levels of 4.1 million. Uh, with regards to stormwater budget, um, it is proposed at 15.6 million, an increase of 1.5 million, right at 1.6 or 11%. It does a, it does assume um, the re, re, uh, the resuming of the rate adjustments in accordance to a rate structure that was adopted. I think it was actually 2018, not 2016, for a five-year um, rate plan. It was suspended last year during COVID, um, and we are proposing to return back to that schedule. Um, it would increase the um, equivalent residential unit on a residential um, rate from $13.32 to $14.15. It's an increase of 83 cents, 83 cents a month um, or 6%. It is, um, this rate of course supports the $93 million in stormwater improvements that was proposed for this five year plan with 11.5 million in capital projects for this coming year. You have a, um, a list of those proposed projects in your, in your um, budget package as well. With regard to the parking fund, um, the proposed budget is 9 million. 
um, with that 1.3 million or 70% of the current of increase over the budget. Um, projected revenues are still below 1819 um, and we could use 2.7. So um, without those funds, you can see that the parking fund budget would be at a deficit um, without there being um, the, in the use of the ARP funds. Um, these funds are allowing us to be able to restore some of our, um, our, our operations, but also allow us to be able to address the maintenance priorities, um, to be able to do some of them, um, to be able to keep our garages, not just, to be, not just be able to keep our garages open, but also um, keeping them functioning and also keeping them maintained so that they are safe and inviting and welcoming to our public to use them. Um, again, this is just the parking fund budget. Uh, you can see that 31% of the budget is for debt service um, related to the parking fund um, and includes, which is a $2.8 million um, service schedule on existing debt. The, eight, the hospitality tax budget, um, it's an increase of 4.2 or 57% over the current year. We are pleased that revenues are coming in better than we had anticipated for the hospitality tax, but wanted to remind you that they are still below the pre-pandemic collections. We do reflect the use of the, of the American Rescue Plan funds. Um, as previously mentioned, we, are, we, have, we have incorporated, we've included um, hospitality tax revenues of um, our 1.7 million of ARP funds in this proposed budget. Um, the hospitality tax budget is broken out by um, existing debt of 2.7. We've restored the general fund transfer to 3.7. Um, we've also incorporated, um, has been brought to city council's discussion, um, incorporation of the um, repairs to the uh, much needed repairs to the five point fountain that the city owns in the amount of $250,000. Um, funding for pre construction work and design of Finley Park rehabilitation of 1.5. As we've talked about um, in the past, that was one of the other programs that we suspended um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we, are, we are anticipating that with the um, continued improvement we are seeing with the hospitality tax, that we'll be able to proceed with that work um, and have incorporated um, um, 1.5 million for the pre-construction work and design that would be um, um, before we actually issue the um, debt um, and, and repair the rehabilitation of this much loved and, and needed work at, this, at, at Family Park. Next, finally, also the allocation of the hospitality tax grant program is 3.4 million. That's an increase of $587,000 in terms of what's programmed in the budget. Um, this does not take into account if there's any reserves or surplus available for allocation. Um, in addition to the budget, it is an increase over the current year we have made we staff have made no recommendations about how city council would allocate those funds, um, but just wanted to bring them forward as a, as a whole amount. And there will probably need to be future conversations about exact how to allocate those funds and how city council um, may move, move forward. We are anticipating releasing an application um, for those funds, um, but still need conversations about the direct and, um, allocation. With regards to the accommodations tax, the budget is 1.5 million. It's a modest increase of 57,000, right at 58, or 3.49%. Um, it is also hit by the pandemic, so we are not at we still are not at we are not at pre-pandemic levels of revenue yet. Um, it, this, with the way those funds come in from the state quarterly, it's really a little bit harder to gauge sort of where we are today. But so far, we are. We are making budget, we are meeting our budget target, but we are still not where we were pre-pandemic. And again, like with hospitality tax, we have not made a specific allocation other than those allocations directly stated by state law. With uses of our accommodation tax, the first um, allocation in state law is $25,000 transfer to the general fund with the remaining 95% uh, are, are broken out by 30% for advertising and promotion, 65% for tourism related, um, city Council typically allocates those um, for um, specific organizations. We do have to utilize an, a committee for that program. We will re-engage that committee here before the June 30th um, time frame. And then, of course, 5% for general purposes. Uh, city Council has also directed those allocations in the past as well. We're prepared to do that um, going forward, too. Um, 
that I'll, I'll stop there, pause there with regards to the budget. Um, I know that was a lot of information and still probably a lot of questions regarding the actual budget part of that. Um, hopefully this accompanies um, the information that you had in your packet, but um, I'll there if there's any comments Ms. Wilson you want to make or any other questions that the council may want to have before we move to the next topic. Any questions or comments from Missy? All right, let's keep it, let's keep it moving then, Missy. Okay. Next, we wanted to bring up the City Budgeting for Equity and Recovery uh, Initiative. This is a Bloomberg's or a What Works Cities program that the city was um, accepted into. We are one of 30 cities participating across the country in this initiative. It is focusing on applying an equity lens to the city's budgeting process. Um, we are working through with What Works Cities. We are working with uh, technical assistance. Um, and other, uh, uh, along with peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning the other cities that are participating in the program, we have specific technical guidance from GFOA as well as some other providers that are assisting us with this work. Um, one of the, the first approach that the city specifically is taking is we will be working on defining what equity means to the city as an organization and in our program. Um, obviously, this is a, an important area and focus of our city council and our city. So having a, 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 a definition that we all work from is very important and, and, un, and, and foundational in our work. So we are hoping to work collectively on, on defining what equity means to the city. Um, from there, we will also be working on the turn the curb in, indicator um, through this initiative. That basically is um, identifying an, an, an equity indicator or a financial indicator that indicates will indicate to us that we are reaching a result that the city desires to achieve through this effort. And we'll also be incorporating um, this, uh, the equity lens as a part of our priority based budgeting module that we've discussed in the past. Uh, we, we were a little suspended on that program with COVID, but we will be resuming that work through this initiative um, and we'll be bringing some of that discussions more to our department along with other stakeholders as we carry out this initiative. This project timeline is really between, it started last October and goes through September um, with the supportive work that is something that is foundational as we proceed um, um, and, and move forward in, in the city. Okay. Any questions there? Any questions, Missy? Okay. The last thing I will bring up again is just a reminder that this budget Ms. that we talked about. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I heard you say the defining the, what diversity is or equity is. Um, Will you do that in its its staff related when you define what that is? Will there be input from other folk? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So there has not been a working definition of what that is as it relates to our city. No, um, I think there are certainly uh, concepts and 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 maybe individualized definitions and efforts and work. I know that through this work, through this project, and as we look at our colleagues around the country that are um, doing this work, most, most, most have started with um, defining what equity means to them specifically. So we felt that it was important to be able to do that here, especially the, we have a number of initiatives, I think, in the city that are addressing and related to the equity within our community. Um, and so working from a, 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 a common viewpoint can only further move us along in that work and help us to better bridge that divide and be able to make sure we are addressing those gaps All right. and disparities. And it's really looking introspectively, Reverend McDowell, um, I know a lot of times when we hear, you know, the big equity, is it's such a, a big thing for people to grasp globally and as a community, but we want it to start um, internally. 
um, in the way that we approach our work. Um, so I just wanted to make that little bit of a distinction that we're, we're trying to start with ourselves as well, with how we're um, going about our business. Well, that's, that's great. And I think it ought to, I think it should be, it ought to be an internal movement and an internal uh, definition of what it, what it, what it is. Yes, but sir. it's also important, I think, once we decide internally of what the group decides on what that definite definition consists of, it would certainly be good to draw in others to make sure that that definition is a collaborative effort and not uh, not anything else. Yes, I guess that's my whole point. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for Missy? So this is, we're just to enclose, um, first of all, thank you to city council, of course, city manager. Um, this is definitely a, a team effort um, into our department um, and bringing this work forward. Um, and so we're, we're, we're pleased to be able to bring this to you. The, uh, just a reminder that everything we discussed today um, at this point is being proposed for advertisement this week for a budget public hearing and first reading on May the 11th, which again would be a special call meeting. We just want to make sure we, we stress and reiterate that so that we are all on the same accord um, before we finish up today's conversation. And thank you again. Missy, thank you so much. I know this is, we all had to step out of our comfort zone a little bit to get through this process in a um, reimagined way, but I think we've tried to do our best and I really appreciate Missy's hard work um, and Jeff and Dan and everyone, but you know, the, our finance professionals are amazing and I appreciate their um, thoughtfulness about such an important part of, of city government and it's our budget and what our citizens expect. So with that, we will move forward with the advertisement unless you all are directing us otherwise. All right, thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. Um, Mayor Benjamin, we um, recognize that I know there's some national news um, pending and, and we just wanted to reassure you all that um, we have been in preparation for that whichever way it may go today with the Chauvin verdict and um, just getting lots of messages here about that as I'm sure you all are as well. So we'll continue along unless you direct us. Um, otherwise we can move into the consent agenda item seven through 29. Any, uh, so moved. Yes. Mm -hmm. right, move. Second. Any discussion? Just Mr. Mayor, just um, very happy to see um, the progress on moving forward with the disparity study and, and to Councilman McDowell's point earlier, I think a lot of the things that we're working on, disparity study, uh, uh, equity survey that should be done soon, and as well as the other conversations I know we had, we, we are making great strides and I'm excited to see uh, this team that's assembled. It's very impressive. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Ms. Wilson. All right. Yes, sir. I'm Ms. sorry. I'm sorry, Mayor. Just to back up for just one moment, will there be an opportunity for any of us to be a part of that conversation on uh, equity? Yes, sir. Of course. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Who the previous question? All right. Kirk, please call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Mayor Benjamin. Aye, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa. 
Yes, sir. The zoning planning matter here is a first reading um, with the, again, unified development ordinance adoption um, for our city of new city of Columbia zoning map. I know Krista has um, given you all reminders about the timeline. Is there a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? With the previous question, Clark Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? <laughs> Yeah, Sam, you're muted. Hi. Well done. Hardy, thank you for the hard work and time and patience and collaboration on this. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Moving into ordinances first reading item 31, ordinance number 2021-010, granting an encroachment to the Municipal Association of South Carolina for the use of the right-of-way area. Motion. So move well, approval. So move. You can't move for the Taj Duval. You can't do that. Yeah. So, so move. I have no <laughs> financial connection with that. I know. I just had to tell you. <laughs> so, so, move, move the previous move the previous question, Kirk Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Item 32, ordinance number 2021-011, amending ordinances 2014-032 and 2012-059, granting encroachments to the University of South Carolina for use of the right-of-way area of the 1500 block of Green Street and 800 block of Pickens Hello. Street. Second. Discussion? With the previous question, call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 33, ordinance number 2021-020, granting an easement to Dominion Energy, South Carolina, Inc., along a portion of city-owned property identified as the Richland County TMS number is I'll out. Move. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? With the previous question, Clark Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 34, ordinance number 2021-028, consenting to the inclusion of property in a multi-county industrial business park for Project Catawba, 919 Catawba Avenue, 318 Lincoln Street, and 312 Lincoln Street in Richland County. Um, I do believe that um, some some who may, if you have any questions, in other words, we yeah. were holding for, I think, Mayor Coble and Adam Beck um, were in the holding room, if there are any questions. Sure, well, let's get the discussion period first. Is there a motion? Um, I, move, I move approval. Is there a second? We Thank can't you wait. for yeah. Thank All, right. All right. This let's is for discussion, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, All sir. right. Second. Uh, Miss Miss Devine, seconded by. She, I think she I think she'd happily take your replacement as a second. So so. <laughs> <laughs> discussion. We got a good discussion here. Let's do it. All right. Um. You see, you have you have Bob and who else? Adam Beck. Okay. All right. And um, I saw Daniel had a question. Would well, that maybe for staff or for the applicants, Daniel? Well, I I, I think it starts from staff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I haven't talked to anybody about this project, so I'm not sure who who's bringing this forward. But I was a little concerned uh, about several issues that weren't addressed in our packet. Which one was safety? 
Um, the other what was brought up at the county about the my understanding this was a solicitation as part of it for, for public parking and it seems like there's only from what I've read only 11 spots that are public parking included in this but yet there's no mention of any of that in our briefing packet um, so I'm, I'm concerned about those issues um, for sure and and would like to understand from our staff it, did did we miss something? Did we not get some information? Um, you know, as I said, I hadn't been contacted, so I don't know who the lobbyist is for this. I'm assuming it's it's Mayor Coble since I'm here. He's on the line, but um, just out of curiosity, do we have any information on um, the safety measure and how that's going to be deferred around those tracks? along with what was the the agreement original agreement around public access parking uh, ryan are you on i know we sought some answers to some of that i'm not sure um regarding the parking mr rickman um what responses did i know ryan forwarded everything that he got when he when he you said, Daniel, you said yeah. this is part of a public parking solicitation? What do you mean? What does that mean? My understanding is part of the, the reason that the county, and I'm this is what I'm told, that's why I'm asking the question. I couldn't find any of the information on our packet that there was supposed to be a greater portion of public parking as part of the incentive that was granted. I'm not familiar with that aspect of it, Mr. Rickman. Ryan or um, and the county has overwhelmingly approved this, haven't they? Wasn't, wasn't a, a pretty significant vote by the county? County's um, approved up to two readings so far. But, um, but like nine two, right? So I would assume they met their their requests or their whatever the demands were. It's come through the standard, you know, commercial development incentive request process I will say okay. with regards to you know the public parking um, while it wasn't mentioned it, um, heavily in the uh, the application that was sent out there was an attached um, presentation that outlines there there will be um, probably 11 uh, on-site public parking spaces provided as part of the structured deck for this and then there will also be uh, 17 uh, parallel, uh, parking sites uh, added along the street fronts of Lincoln and Catawba, I believe, as well as part of the uh, pedestrian and, and right-of-way improvements that will be required um, when they install the sidewalks there. Um, but that's that's the also information. Public, also public parking? Yes, now, sir. is that a private street or a public street? I'm confused. Public street. That's that's along uh, Lincoln and Catawba streets. Um, so that the streets adjacent to the south and west of where the project will be. Ryan, um, let me ask you this: um, the issue of safety was that considered a thought through at at the uh, county on the county side. I, I know it's been brought up and, and discussed and um, I, I believe even some of the neighborhoods have have kind of had some concerns about it and have been in discussions with developers. So I know it's been a topic of conversation. I wasn't involved in a lot of those or, or in any of those conversations. So that may be something, you know, that um, Mayor Coble or Mr. Beck could speak better to. Um, it's my understanding that some safety concerns were brought up because of the railroad proximity and that the developers have um, made some changes to address that, but they, they would need to provide you specifics. The, um, are, are, are Mr. Beck and Mayor Coble on or, or no? Mr. Beck is on and he's able to speak at the time. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear as well about the about the railroads because I know we got a bunch going on down there uh, regarding the quiet zones and some of the railroad improvements. Um, curious as to how they uh, affect this. When we talk about neighborhoods, we don't have a lot of residential housing down there. If I if I, if I know what we're talking about, this is, I guess you got Olympia to the to the south and Granby pretty far away on the other side of uh, 
of everything to the uh, to the west. So, uh, but but um, you heard the questions, Mr. Beck. I assume. Yes, and, and appreciate the time uh, this afternoon, council members. And yeah, happy to answer any, any questions. Can everybody, I guess, hear me okay? Kind of first of all. Yes. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So I think maybe the first one, I guess, kind of question addressing safety, I think is as part of our BOZA and site plan approval uh, back in December of 2020, um, I believe the planning commission uh, as a condition of our approval um, has required us, uh, you know, to, to do some additional signage striping um, kind of, you know, reflections to, again, kind of help, help with the safety concerns. I think that were brought up at that time. And I think the same safety concerns you guys, uh, as well have, and I believe also, and, and you guys, I'll defer to you, I'll probably know more about this than, than we do, but during with the quiet zone discussions, I believe the, the improvements, I think are already been funded. I think it's either the state or, or county level for kind of improved um, safety crossings, I think over that Lincoln crossing. And so I think with the combination of both of those things, we, we feel like we've, we've met kind of the, the concerns that were, were brought up during planning commission, then also at the county level. And Mr. Rick had a question about parking. Um, I think Ryan addre addressed it specifically. Um, but I'm trying to remember when we first um, brought this incentive to the county. I mean, obviously, the, the, the major concern was, wasn't trying to get free public parking. It was, it was, it was about the, the significant tax burden uh, uh, that 6% that properties were, were, were bearing and how it stymied development. We're talking about a 70 plus million dollar uh, development here, um, even with the abatement paying close to a million a year and, and tw two times that once the, um, uh, the property matures in 11 years. I just think I want to just keep our eyes on, 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 that, on that significant development. So, and if in fact, this is not something we want to do prospectively, uh, let's keep that in mind too. But um, if someone could just take a look too, because I, I, I want to say the county one of the county council people told me that they, they, they voted significantly in favor of it. So, um, but what are the questions we have for Mr. Beck? And, and I don't know if the mayor, if Mayor Cobles wants to. Any other questions? I think Mayor Cobles available. I see, um, I see Tamika has her hand up. Well, I was just going to share. I, I, um, I spoke with Mr. Beck and Mayor Coble earlier. I shared some of my concerns and, and reservations. Um, you know, I do think that we need to have the bigger conversation about prospectively as to whether or not we, there is a need to continue to incentivize these types of projects. Um, I, I think that we primed the well. We certainly did what we needed to do. We, we sunset it and then we continued. So I think we need to really look at that. Um, but one of the things when I did discuss with him, um, the student housing portion, uh, Mr. Beck addressed, um, maybe um, changing the structure so that it was not um, primarily for students. And so Mr. Beck or Mayor Coble, can you address that uh, for everybody so that we can discuss what you're willing to do on that piece? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate that. Oh, sorry. I, I was gonna, this is Bob Coble. <clears throat> First, I've been listening for the last two hours and I've had a flashback. <laughs> uh, and I uh, had to call uh, Kirkman Finley just to get grounded in, uh, in uh, uh, city council. Y'all do a terrific job. Um, let me say the um, issue that uh, arose was would they um, uh, lease or rent per bed? And, and they don't really do that, but I, that seems to be an issue that they will be delighted to address and rent per unit. Um, and uh, you know, get the, uh, however that needs to be um, uh, done in a way that you're comfortable it'll happen. Um, that then it would be just like any other uh, commercial uh, property. I do think this is, this is the policy the city and the county adopted in 2019. And if you want to change it, I, we certainly understand that. But, you know, they've gone through the process, uh, BOZA, Planning Commission, uh, two readings at um, uh, County Council, and actually it was only one dissenting vote at each one of those two, uh, third reading scheduled. Um, and so uh, th they're willing to do anything to work in any way uh, to address safety issues um, or, you know, 
uh, how it operates vis-a-vis uh, -vis student housing in any way that you, uh, uh, you, you think appropriate. Let me ask uh, Adam if he would uh, add on to the uh, per unit issue and uh, uh, any other issue. Yeah, and thank you, Mayor Coble. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of to direct the direct to the question. Yeah, we're, we're obviously open to to leasing by the unit. You know, our, our kind of original discussions and I think kind of message we've had through through most of our conversations with the county, and I think even through our initial kind of meetings with the city and, and planning commission and Boz, it was you know we you know we leased uh, you know anybody that would qualify, whether it was on a per bed or per per unit basis. And I understand there's you know stigmas that go with with either one of those. Um, and again, we didn't want to kind of you know limit limit the you know the the target renter there, um, but again, if there's concerns over over the idea or the the thought or the structure leasing by the bed, we are um, absolutely okay leasing by the unit um, to kind of address you know any concern that may have. And, and one other thing, Adam, if you could address, I believe there are 56 public spaces that will be as a result of uh, of this project. Um, uh, 11 of them are in the garage. The rest of them are outside, which of course would be much convenient uh, for the public that might want to use it. But Adam, could you address that? Yes, that's yeah, yeah, that's correct. So it's it's yeah, the 11 in the part in the in the parking garage, and then the rest will be along um, Catawba and Lincoln, as well as 10 surface spaces, kind of just outside the garage um, that will all be available for public use. Um, and then as, as well as kind of the, the rest of the I guess kind of overall, you know, improvements we're doing, and I don't know if this is kind of the the, doc, the documents that were um, shared was, you know, we, we're, we're doing a significant, significant amount of uh, environmental cleanup on site. Obviously, removing kind of the two existing kind of light industrial buildings. Uh, we're improving obviously the streetscape landscape, you know, along Lincoln and Catawba streets. You know, hopefully trying to kind of you know bridge the connection to kind of you know downtown Gervais Street, you know, U.S. Greek Village to you know the Granby and Olympia Mills neighborhoods. Um, so again, it's, it's not specifically just related to parking, but as, as well as those other improvements, um, uh, and utility upgrades and, and, um, such that were, you know, is part of the overall application and commercial incentive. All right. Thank you. Any more questions for Mr. Beck? Mayor Cole? Has there, has there yeah. been, has there been community input relative to the pro, uh, to the project? Yes, there have. We met with uh, the Granby Mills and Olympia Mills Neighborhood Associations uh, a few times, actually had uh, a couple phone calls as follow-ups as, we, as we've gone through the process. Um, we got actually their input before even submitting, um, I think, for our, our planning commission and, and BOSA submittals, because uh, we want to come in and, and obviously be good neighbors and make everybody aware of what, what we're doing and what we're projecting. We're not trying to, um, you know, hide anything. We're going to be honest and upfront. And I think what was great is we showed some preliminary elevations of what we were kind of envisioning in our first kind of cut or draft of renderings and actually present that to the neighbor associations and actually um, got some very good and constructive feedback that actually we incorporated in our next rendition of renderings, uh, which I think you guys may have seen through our submittals, um, that the neighbor association um, honestly basically was the main reason why we made a lot of these changes and kind of went for more of a, a modern industrial look as opposed to some other designs that we were thinking we were, we were going to go down. So um long long answer to a short question uh yes we've we've uh, been in communication throughout the, throughout our process well with that said mr beck did, did are they supportive of it did they give you a letter of support yeah. For, yeah, for those conversations yeah that's what i was asking yeah yeah that's what we yeah, are all i mean about. i'm sorry yeah i mean we I, I mean i'll go back and look i don't know if we have a letter or an email but um I've gotten, I guess, verbal support, and I guess maybe the other way to say it, we haven't, they haven't come out against us or, or at any point in time. So um, that's not on the letter specifically for you that I can share, but um, in all the time communications we've had, they've been supportive of the project. Now that's, let me make sure, that's 675 beds or 575? It's 278 units and 670-ish um, beds in one, two, and three-bedroom units. Okay. All right. Okay. Can, can you address, uh, we talked about it before you got online, um, the safety and traffic concerns 
Yes. Is this in is it relation to the Lincoln uh, Railroad crossing? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I think again, as kind of part of our site plan approval, we've agreed to work with the city uh, to you know address any kind of safety precautions, whether it's you know signage, painting, striping, reflectors, to kind of help improve that that crossing to address safety concerns. Um, and then as well as I think, you know, again, I think that quiet zone or, or that specific crossing has already been funded, I think, at a, at a different stage to your level for um, even, uh, you know, more improvements above that. Um, so we've, we've incorporated that, and that's a condition of our site plan approval, which we received back in December. And then um, I guess in terms of traffic, I think that, you know, will, will be dependent, I think, what ultimately is decided by the railroad and by the city and state on kind of what the plan is for the, the railroad in you know that specific section, so we're we're willing to work with anybody and all agencies to to alleviate any you know specific traffic concerns. But we've had a traffic study completed, and there wasn't any um, thing specifically stated that you know any additional remediation was needed based on a project. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. I call for the previous question. With the previous question, call the roll. Mr. Brennan? No. Mr. Rickman? No. Mr. McDowell? No. Mr. Duval? No. Mr. Vine? No. Mr. Davis? Yeah, here you see him. No. Mayor Benjamin? Um, I'm actually going to vote in the affirmative. And um, we need to go ahead and make a determination. It may be this specific project. Um, um, the developers, the location, maybe the proximity to the railroad, whatever it happens to be. But as it relates to the incentive and whether or not we choose that we want to um, officially sunset it, not yet set. I think it's um, it's supposed to sunset in, uh, at the end of next year. Uh, then we need to make an affirmative policy decision. Uh, these developers um, have expended significant sums of money to move forward on the policy that we have approved. Um, and um, it's not pro-business um, for us to, to, to uh, change things midstream. So just let, let's pray over that. Uh, think about that going forward. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to the next item on the agenda. Yes, sir. Item 35, ordinance number 2021-029, amending the 1998 Code of Ordinances of the City of Columbia, South Carolina, Chapter 23, Utilities and Engineering, Article 1 in general. Section 231, civil penalties for violations related to wastewater collection and treatment, water treatment and distribution, Article 4, wastewater service, Section 231. Is there a second? Second. second. Any, any discussion? Move the previous question, Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mm -hmm. Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? <laughs> On mute. It's an aye. Someone's got to take away Sam's man. mute button. Can we disable Sam's mute button? Is that possible? <laughs> you don't want to do that. Yeah, I know we don't actually. I know we don't. <laughs> uh, I have an aye, ma'am. Thank you. I'm sorry, Erica, did you say something? No, ma'am. Thank you. Um, as we move forward with safety plans, they're in adherence with COVID-19 pandemic safety and social distancing protocols as published by the CDC and DHEC, uh, South Carolina DHEC. And we've uh, had these for the various events reviewed and approved by Columbia Police Department. The event on your agenda today is the resolution number R2021029, authorizing consumption of beer and wine only within Boyd Plaza, adjacent oh, to the Columbia Museum of Art. Ms. Wilson. Yes, sir. 
What's the size of the event? What is what was it detailed on the uh, paperwork? I don't know that we necessarily we we can't address capacity necessarily anymore, Reverend McDowell. Um, you know, it's an event that's open to the public. The um, I do now, know all, all COVID all COVID and CDC requirements, the plans are in place? Those that we can authorize through city processes, yes, sir. Um, but it's a, it's a public event. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Move approval. Um, second. And I would say, um, Ed, uh, just as a, um, as a venue manager, the art museum does a pretty good job out there uh, um, uh, at, at, at Boyd Plaza, so my my guess is they'll be they'll be managing things effectively as well if they give you any comfort. Um, no, move really the previous. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll move the previous question. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. No. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Devon? Aye. Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you, ma'am. Moving into a period of resolutions, item 37 is resolution number R2021-043, approving the honorary naming of the Lion Street Community Garden. Move, move approval. Second. Second. Right. Move approved question. I, I know, I mean, we love, we love, we love Marvin. Miss him, something awful. Good man. Move the previous question, ma'am. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye, sorry. All right, all right, little Sam. All right. <laughs> Mr. David? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Marvin was the smoothest bossy man I've ever known. He would get he would get what he wanted, but he but he was always nice and smiling um, every step of the way. We miss him. And it doesn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily have to be in a council chamber. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'd do that in the grocery store. It wouldn't even have to be it wouldn't even have to be in his neighborhood either. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, good man, good man. Item 38, resolution number R2021-048, approving the honorary naming of the intersection of Colonial Drive and Sanders Street, Bill Shives Way. I move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Right. We'll move the previous question, Clark Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. And Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 39 is resolution number R2021026, supporting the Housing Authority of the City of Columbia engaging in the Marion Street High Rise Disposition Project. And I will say, um, Mayor and Council, that I've asked several questions about this. Um, I didn't want to ask you to hold it unless you know that's your decision. I'm I'm trying to just get some clarity on what you're actually endorsing here um, with the disposition and and the adjacent property. So, Ms. Wilson, um, I talked with I met with Ms. Uh, Matthews and uh, Chairman Cromarty. Um, and Ms. Commissioner Sinclair yesterday. So this is a, a HUD requirement. They're going through the, all the checks and this is required for them to actually relocate the resident. Um, I got commitment from her that this does not um, commit any particular disposition, um, but there are some questions and I, I, we can, we've got a long agenda. So I'd like to maybe talk about it with um, particularly 
Krista um, and Amy, there are some concerns I have about, apparently about um, Historic Columbia um, and their role in, uh, they're one of the boxes that have to be checked uh, for HUD and there are some discussion as to whether or not there's some um, artifacts that are more on the property. So that, that's a bigger discussion. I think we have to have this, but my, um, my understanding, this is just to allow them to move forward with the relocation of the residents and they'd like to start that process in May. So this is time sensitive. Because this, the, the historic Columbia piece is out at Man Simons. Is that, is that the, the, or yeah. something on the, on the property itself? On the property itself, apparently um, in 1980 something, there was some archeological dig that may have uh, revealed some artifacts that um, are on the housing authority property. Um, and so under, from what I understand, it was really, um, it was a little confusing. That's why I'd like our staff to be involved. But as Ms. Matthews indicated to me, um, South Carolina Archives and History actually has to be part of the people who ag agree. And there is some conversation as to whether or not the man Simon's footprint is indeed larger than we know and that it would extend towards the Marion Street property. Um, and if so, there's a desire to obtain that property, which would uh, reduce the footprint already existing for the housing authority. So it, it seems like there's a lot of um, discussion and I don't understand why it's a look any different than Bull Street and how we were allowed to do the archeological dig, but they it didn't affect the, the sale of the property. So I think we have to, ask more questions and understand that because um, that will affect their potential redevelopment of that site. Well, remember that entire, whether it's Man Simons or that entire neighborhood was a you know significant African-American uh, community. And we just conducted the Man Simons dig just a few years ago and found um, you know some significant artifacts that told a lot about Columbia's history. My guess is that there should be some Sanborn maps out there from the early part of the last century that should tell us exactly what was there. Um, so that, that, yeah, I think let's definitely make sure we cross those seas and dot those eyes. I think uh, our staff has been asking those questions and has some, Missy mm -hmm. may have some information. We were just concerned that if you go ahead and approve it, maybe we need to adjust this letter to reflect, um, you know, that all of these things are dealt mm -hmm. with properly. Mm -hmm. uh, but Missy, mm -hmm. what do you want to add? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Wilson, I spoke with Housing Authority earlier today and they have um, agreed that when those parcels are identified, they all already have a survey plat showing which parcels they would um, donate to the city to combine with the Man Simon's house. They've got a few more questions they need to clarify before that actually happens. But certainly they're receptive to us, including that acknowledgement in any letter. She did reiterate the time sensitivity. They cannot file with HUD. Um, the motion they need to file to vacate the property until they have our approved resolution. So it's very time sensitive from their standpoint. Davis. Two question. Who owns, who owns the survey and, um, what, when did they do it? When the date on the survey? They, he, she sent it to me earlier. They have recently performed that survey after conversations to include Historic Columbia about the need to make sure that we're protecting that site. There's actually two small parcels. One is 0.06 acres. They refer to that as the ghost parcel. And we know for sure we want that. There's another parcel that's 0.19 acres that we believe may also need to be deeded over um, to combine with the Man Simon's house and they're willing to do that. Their one question is, can they still um, meet all of the code requirements for the remaining parcel and sell that parcel once they do those two smaller sites to us? And we're working through those answers right now. Um, certainly they can sell it. We just need to make sure that it would be code compliant without those two small parcels they would do to us. Let me look and see if I can tell you the date of the survey. I'm looking for that right now. If y'all have more questions, I'll answer that shortly. Uh, I think we just got a guilty verdict. Absolutely. 
Good. Um, um, would y'all mind, Red McDowell? Would you? Would you mind? Would you mind, Ed? He's watching it. I know. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Would you? Would you? Would you mind giving us a word of prayer? Mm -hmm. uh, as, as before we go on with the rest of this discussion, just in the wake of this verdict. Sure. Thank you, brother. These are turbulent times in our nation. Turbulent times in terms of chaos. Lord, we would simply pray that this nation of ours is and it confines itself into a vacuum of peace and harmony. Lord, we know that there are things happening throughout this country of ours, and particularly in this city of ours. Okay. We would simply ask that you might continue to wrap your arms around those of us who understand and sense the tenets of peace and harmony. Lord, we know that violence is contagious and we know that it metastasizes everywhere. So Lord, we just simply ask that you might give us a kind of peace that passes all understanding. For decisions that are made, we simply ask that in your wise counsel, that you might allow us to vent and to feel your presence. Lord, we need your help in these coming days. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, um, Rev. Um, a lot of people are going through some very difficult times right now. <laughs> And uh, it's um, uh, it's important we we work hard to remain together. So thank thank you, Ed McDowell. Thank you, um, Daniel. Um, you know, are we going to get a briefing from the housing authority um, on what the plan is and and what they're where they're relocating the residents and what their long-term plan is, because this is going to be the third area in our downtown area that is going to be vacated by the housing authority. And we know Gonzalez Gardens is not complete and it's been sitting there for a long time. ABC, Alan Benedict, which I hate that we can't rehab it because I think it'd be an incredible project with some incredible talent, but it's not our choice. And then we're going to have this building and, you know, there are a lot of rumors flying around on what's going to happen at Allen Benedict. Um, there's a big push. I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of different things. I think it'd be great if we just get some clarity so that we, we understand what their plan is moving forward. I think that's important. We've gotten, um, I think we may have, I'm not sure, the last official briefing we got, and then um, had some conversations with the, with the chairman and other commissioners that indicate some action, but I have not seen the, the, the final plans and, and some very clear direction as to what's going to happen with these properties. I think that's important we get that sooner um, rather than later, because I believe even the timelines that we were shown last time, there was a presentation, I don't think we've come close to meeting those timelines. I'd like to see that as well. Uh, Mr. Mr. Davis, um, I uh, I kind of I agree with Daniel, but my my concern is um, we talk of the downtown area, we are relocating a significant number of African Americans, and the question is, where do they go? Are they going to have another opportunity to live within the in the real inner parts of the city. Keep that in mind. That's a significant number of people that are going to be relocated. The question is, where are you going to put them? So, so I briefly spoke with Housing Authority again this morning. The first question you had, the survey dated March 19th of 2021, Mr. Davis. So it's a recent survey. 
the okay. um, I, I would only uh, be interested if that uh, survey uh, matches the the uh, was 19 whatever I remember that one I remember both of them so you know just kind of look I, at the footprints Okay, I will share it. And what this survey does is show the two parcels that they would subdivide um, to deed to the city if we are interested in that, which I think we are at least in the ghost parcel based on historic Columbia's input. Um, I do know that there's a total unit count in this property of 146, but there's only around 80 um, individuals in the property right now. Columbia Housing has told me they can't really um, start talking about their relocation plan for those 80 residents until they file with HUD or they, they, they've got to follow the HUD rules and they have to file an action with HUD prior to really laying out the relocation plan. However, they have worked with these residents and they're very familiar with the interest of these individuals as far as where whether they would want to stay in the city, whether there's specific properties they want to go to, or if they have family elsewhere and would want to go somewhere else in the state. Um, I don't have those details, but it did sound like they've worked with the individual residents to, to identify options at the time they are able to do that. And Ms. Devine, I know you're working with Housing Authority a lot too. I'm glad to ask for a briefing if you want me to do that, or if that's something that you want to reach out to Ivory to ask for, um, I'll defer to you. No, you guys go go ahead. I mean, I think that she would be happy to come um, and, and talk. I think to just elevate what Missy said, there's a process that HUD requires. And so this, they're, they're checking boxes. Um, but, um, you know, Councilman McDowell and I met with Ms. Ms. Matthews maybe two months ago, and we made it clear of our desire that relocations um, happen within the city and where they can adaptively reuse properties that they do. Um, and she heard that loud and clear and I spoke with her about that again yesterday. I think that they have significant challenges of the, the, the maintenance of, of the facilities. Um, and so I think that, that they're doing the best they can. I do know that there are uh, new properties that they have um, obtained that are within the city um, and that that is part of where their relocation. So they're being very cognizant of the fact that they want we want to maintain our residents in the city um, and certainly make sure that they're they are on bus lines and other things. So they're very sensitive to that. And I just think it's probably well over over time for a briefing um, and we can raise all these these concerns and, and questions and, and get a briefing. I would say, Missy, we probably would need to uh, figure out what needs to be in public and what not, might need to be in executive session because I do know that there is information that they cannot uh, share publicly at this time. Mika and Ed, did they give you any idea of a timeline? I mean, obviously, I know yes. no, a number of different reasons that um, um, different projects have gone offline, um, but uh, it'd be nice to see a start date on one of them. Uh, at least uh, very soon, because I know they're not just the gardens or, or Allen Benedict and now uh, Marion Street, but I know there's several other projects they've been looking at working with some developers on. But are we going to see go on anything anytime soon? I think go on Gonzalez is, is imminent. Um, and so I don't know if Councilman McDowell has additional timeline, but I think that's very close. Um, I do know, and I think it may have been on our agenda at one time, um, the, the bonds um, are also something that they're looking at and they, um, I know she sent us a list of the, uh, the different bonds that they wanna look at. So I think that's part of um, their Im um, immediate plan as well is get the funding in place to get some of these projects up and running. Steve, um, Mr. Mayor, there has, there was a timeline, Daniel, uh, that was emailed out to us some time ago. Um, and I want to say it was early March uh, that Ms. Matthews did send out a timeline, particularly for uh, Gonzalez and for the place there off of Two Notch Road. I can't, I can't call Car them. Carter Street. Carter Street, that's correct. Uh, Carter Street. There are some architectural drawings uh, that they've uh, put together. 
And of course that looks very, very promising. But there, Daniel, there is a timeline schedule that she did send out to Could answer. You hear that? Because I just checked my email. I haven't received an email from Miss Matthews since January of 2021. Okay. January, 20, January 27th to be specific. Um, yeah. And, and, um, and I, I don't have it either. Um, the, uh, I was, I was more so thinking about the, the report from, I guess, well over a year uh, ago on on how some things would move forward. And and I'm sure, I mean, hopefully the, the, the time has given us the opportunity to, to really make some even better, more solid decisions. But I, 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 if, if we're going to start turning dirt on, on the gardens, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. Um, um, obviously, the mm -hmm. proper relocation of the residents, um, preferably in and near their own, their, their own communities, and then the opportunity to repatriate those properties. Uh, is um, is so important, but obviously the eventual use of those properties, highest and best use, um, mixed use, mixed income, whatever it looks like, it'd just be nice to see that and actually see some. Um, um, I mean, we're we're still in the middle of a pretty dog on a hot market with a, with a significant need for affordable housing. Uh, let's not miss the market uh, because people need it, and um, and it, so if things if things are moving, I'd love to see that too. And it doesn't have to be a, a, a full presentation to council. I mean, I'll, I'll take a written report with some um, with some specifics as when things are actually happening. The uh, the emails from the housing authority don't have Ivory Matthews name on the address. It's a funny, funny looking thing. But she has been sending out uh, communications about every other week. And she has talked about just about all the things y'all have talked about right now. Yeah, that's the one. It, it'll say no reply. Yeah. Um, and they, yeah, they're continuously sending out stuff, but those are the public ones. I do think that based on the comments, maybe a private briefing would, would, um, answer some of these questions. All right. Let's, let's get, let's get an update on all the projects. Great to see. Good. Okay. Right. Um, so for item 39 or, um, how do you all want to proceed today? Um, the said times are the essence. Um, I, I want to be real transparent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of asking the housing authority for things and, and, and uh, not getting what we asked for. Um, we, we had a pretty serious back and forth. Ed, Ed's smiling because he knows exactly where I'm going on, on the uh, shopping center uh, that I, I, I'm trying our darndest to make sure people had access to, to healthy foods. And um, we got the stiff arm uh, there uh, and I didn't feel good about it. And I shared that uh, very directly. Uh, I understand if the housing authority is going to focus on the central role of simply providing housing as opposed to trying to address all the social determinants of health, I understand that that's okay. But at very least, let's start seeing some housing come out the ground and, and post haste. Uh, I, I'm fine with voting for this resolution, uh, but I, I would hope and pray that we'll start seeing some movement and not more talk. We don't, we don't need more thinking, we need action. I'll move the previous question. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Hines? Did Ed fall Aye. over? Mr. Davis? <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm not homesick, brother. <laughs> I thought you had turned I, over I in your the chair. mayor's concerns. <laughs> I'm going to vote as I do. <laughs> well, vote in the affirmative, and we'd like a prompt report from the um, from the executive director and, and the chairman. Yes, sir. I just forwarded you guys a, a, a timeline as well on some of the projects, so that might be helpful and while we're yeah. waiting on the report. Thank you. Did you get that, Daniel? I'll let you know. I wonder, I wonder what special list y'all on that me and Daniel aren't on, by the way, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> I think y'all are talking. You missed, you missed the exchange. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Everybody got it except you, Mr. Man. <laughs> Oh, Dan, you got it, Daniel? You got the no reply? I just, I just searched no replies and I got a bunch of other uh, stuff. I got it now from Topeka. I don't, think yeah, they, okay. they, I don't think they still got what we're talking about, Reverend McDowell and Mr. Paul. <laughs> Y'all cracking jokes on us? Yeah, yeah. All right. He had turned over in his chair. 
<laughs> no, I'm not homesick yet, brother. I'm still alive and well. All right, All right. item 40. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> Resolution number R2021037, certifying building site as a textile mill site pursuant to the South Carolina Textiles Communities Revitalization Act. Title I move approval. Second. Any discussion? We'll move the previous question, Clerk Call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. 41, resolution number R2021039, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement of sale and purchase between the City of Columbia and Dominion Energy South Carolina, Inc., for the purchase of 2.24 acres known as 3000 Hardin Street in Richland County. No so move. Right, so Second. Uh, all right. We'll move the previous question. I'm sorry, discussion. We'll move the previous question, Clerk Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. Item 42, resolution number R2021-041, authorizing the city manager to execute a purchase and sales agreement between the city of Columbia and Eden's Graham Partners for the purchase of approximately two so point five acres. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? We'll move the previous question, Clerk Call Roll. Mr. Vernon? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 43, resolution number R2021044, encouraging Governor Henry McMaster to request the U.S. Department of the Treasury to release South Carolina's allocation of appropriated funds from the homeowner assistance fund authorized through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And I think Ms. Devine sponsored this. Yeah, yes, I just um, kind of uh, uh, related to our conversation earlier, there are monies that we got direct allocation. There's also monies that go to the state. There are certain things that our state actually has to request in order to get it. Um, and so um, in working with um, Habitat for Humanity and as well, uh, Habitat for Humanity and some other homeless uh, providers, and um, we've at, they've asked that we do this resolution. I've already spoken to Kyle, so once we pass it, uh, we will make sure that it goes to the governor's office. Um, I do understand that others have sent similar letters or resolutions, so hopefully there will be a request from our state for this additional funding um, to help our homeowners um, and rental assistants um, get help. So All right. Is there a second? Second. Move the previous question for call roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a period of appointments, uh, Mayor and Council is on your agenda with two items, the Climate Protection Action Committee and the Columbia Housing Authority, which I think that is the resident um, seat, but I'll allow Ms. Wood to help you all. Who? Thank you, Manager Wilson. Who's Ms. Wood? <laughs> Ms. Jenkins Wood. <laughs> oh, I didn't know who that was. Who do we have? Who do we have with seat back? Actually, you know, I had to tease you at least one time. I know, I do. Uh, me too, Mayor. <laughs> All right. Uh, how many seats do we have on seat back? Oh, seat back. Uh, there's three officers. Um, it's actually the new slate of officers elect. 
on your memo and they're asking for you to approve the flight of the officers. All right. Was there a motion? Any discussion? Move approval of the slate produced by CPAC. Second. Any discussion? Will the previous question clerk call the roll? Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Next up, we have the Columbia Housing Authority Resident Commissioner. Again, this is to select a resident that meets the qualifications of actually living in one of the properties, um, living within the city limits, um, and to be considered to assist with CHA uh, input. And we have um, the applicants that you were sent. Please also look at your uh, recent email as well. Ashley, can I add, um, in looking at the list that Ms. Wood has um, provided us, there was an applicant um, that was missing from the list that I know sent an application. I'm not sure if it got lost in the mail, um, but when I when I saw reviewing my packet, so she's not over there, I confirmed with her that she did send it. So she has sent me a, a, a copy of her application along with a copy of a letter written by the MLK neighborhood um, endorsing her application. And I've sent that to Ms. Wood. I don't know if we can get it sent to everybody, but um, the is, this Kimble, would be is this Kimball and Hicks? Kimball and Hicks, yeah. Uh, she'd, be, she'd be an excellent appointment appointee. Yes. So, so, is Miss, is Miss, so is Mr. Green is, ter is termed out? He is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, he is. I moved the appointment of Kimball and Hicks. Yes. I'm sorry, Miss, Mr. 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 McDonald. Uh, actually, let me ask you a question. Miss Wood, I'm sorry. Yes, um, sir. Let me ask you a question. Um, there was a vetting process. Um, yeah, well, essentially, um, the applications, yes, they were open for a month and they applied either by mailing in or sending it online. Um, and from that point on, you all have received all of the applications that were submitted. However, the board made additional recommendations that you submit that from the administrative committee. Of course, we've had long and genuine conversations about the renaming of the park there in Bull Street. Uh, Dr. Bobby Donaldson and um, and Robin Waits have been very resourceful in allowing us to uh, look at persons and look at names. Uh, the committee at its last meeting decided to go ahead and uh, do some additional vetting of those names that were submitted, uh, somewhere between 15 and 17 names. Uh, the committee, which is composed of Howard and, uh, and Sam, uh, we consensually decided on the name of Paige Ellington. Paige Ellington. There has been conversations with, uh, with uh, the Hughes company and of course, uh, in our deliberations, we thought that Mr. Ellington was the person uh, to name that park afterwards. Of course, Mr. Ellington, whose house is still standing there in the, uh, I think in the Wheeler Hill area. Uh, Arsenal Hill. Arsenal Hill, I'm sorry. Arsenal Hill. In the Arsenal Hill area. Uh, he was a self-taught uh, architect that worked very closely with uh, Dr. Uh, Babcock. Uh, he was very instrumental in his studies to, in the forming of, of uh, domes for the buildings. Uh, he was very instrumental in the building of bakery there and several other buildings in that area. Uh, of course, we bring this name to you for your approval. And of course, there are other names that we'd like to see throughout the park as it relates to toppers, uh, street naming, and that sort of thing. So Mr. Mayor, we bring this name to the council. And there are other members of the committee, perhaps that would like to uh, say something. Howard? Yeah, um, 
Thank you, Ed. Uh, Paige Ellington is a, is a really special person when it's connected to the Bull Street property. He was an enslaved person from Rockingham, North Carolina, who was sold to Columbia. Uh, he taught himself against his master's wishes uh, the, the art of bricklaying and became a master bricklayer. Uh, he was befriended by Dr. Babcock, and because of his architectural skills, he actually designed several of the buildings that are on the campus. We know that he did the Parker Annex that's still standing down there, and we are using Dr. Babcock's book called Asylum Doctor, who has extensive footnotes and references where these, where these uh, documents are kept. And Dr. Donaldson is going to the Carolinian Library and get that box uh, and see what else he, Mr. Ellington built uh, on the property. As Ed said, his house is still standing uh, down on Arsenal Hill. He built the original st steeple for First Presbyterian Church, and he was instrumental in, in the founding and the um, worship in several of the churches that are still active in Columbia today. During re Reconstruction, he was in political office and had a lot of uh, a lot of influence in, in the politics of the city. Uh, and he, he is a, a very worthy person to name that park out of, uh, after. We hope to name other facilities, other put other wayfaring signs in the park to take care of the 14 or 15 other uh, very creditable names also to, to honor the people that um, help develop the Bull Street property. The, Sam? Um, I, I, I concur with um, Ed and Howard said it well. He represents for us in Columbia. Um, he was very ecumenical in his service to churches. Uh, he was a member of the Washington Street Methodist Church a member of the uh, Bethel AME Church, Latson. and of course, uh, a member of the Latson Presbyterian Church. <laughs> so he was a guy who had, who had all the credentials of leadership for our city. Uh, I understand that he was uh, an elected official, uh, joined the Board of Health, and um, joined the Board of Health as as a member of that board for mental health in 1875, I believe. Lord. So this man represents uh, a real gift to, to uh, Columbia. So I bring this name, I raise this name for your consideration. Was the, was the plan uh, to, to get approval today? Or um, uh, have y'all dialogue with, uh, obviously Bobby and, and, and Robin, we're very involved in advancing this, and have you have you um, conferred with the Hughes as well? Yes, 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 sir. Yeah. Hughes, uh, Robert, and uh, Claire. I think that's right. Claire Chandler. Chandler. That was Chandler. They were right in the midst of that conversation, so we're ready to act on that today, Mr. Mayor. I think it's a wonderful. I think it's a wonderful recognition, and I, I love when uh, that that period in our history. Um, uh, the Reconstruction era, in particular, was such an amazing time, particularly in South Carolina. We led we led the country in many in many ways, in many respects, in lifting up a name of someone who others might not ever have known existed. Uh, an ordinary person who led an extraordinary life is a pretty amazing opportunity. Uh, that's a motion. Um, a I second. Second. Yeah, second the motion. Thank you. Uh, any, any further discussion? Thank you all for your work on this. And um, move the previous question to Kirk Carl Rowe. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Uh, could y'all send out the bio on the gentleman, please? Yes. Yes, sir. I forward that information. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. 
Erica. Mayor, have a report as well. Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Devine. Um, I'm sorry, Ed, you to finish? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Devine. Erica, if you would not only send it, how about sending that bio to all of us? I mean, we have it already. And uh, Howard has that delightful book, The, the Asylum Doctor. Uh, but the bio would be helpful for those of you who don't know Mr. Elliott. Uh, uh, Eric, send the PowerPoint that, that Historic Columbia used. It has not only Paige Ellington, but the other considerations on Ellington. there. Yes, so sir. Send, it'll, it'll have the bio for him, but it's got everybody else on there, too. Sure will. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mr. Lyon. Um, just Mr. Mayor, the uh, just an update from the tax study committee. Um, Councilman Duvall, Councilman Rickman, and I met this morning. Um, as previously reported um, in our initial meeting, we decided um, that it might be best to get each of us uh, find a, an economist who can uh, review Dr. Galatson's um, study and meet with us to give us any feedback and any um, considerations that uh, as we move forward. So. Uh, we have each selected um, an economist. Um, we've got Stephen Walters, J.K. Walters, uh, James London, and Holly Obrick, um, and all three have agreed to serve in this capacity. Um, we uh, plan to meet, and uh, Ms. Hammond will send you guys the bios for these three, um, as well as uh, Professor Derek Black uh, from the law school. He is not an economist, but he is an expert on school equity and school funding. And so we thought as we elevate this conversation, we certainly need to have someone with his expertise that could maybe help us um, make certain considerations that aren't um, just economic based, but certainly equity based as it relates to our schools and, and the way they are funded and taxed. So our goal is to have an initial meeting within the next two weeks with the three economists and ourselves to uh, hear their uh, their assessment of Dr. Wilson's report, as well as um, any considerations that they think that we need to have as far as how the process sh should move forward, uh, especially bringing in the county and, and other stakeholders as part of the conversation. Um, after the six of us meet along with staff, uh, we plan to bring in Professor Black uh, so that he can add um, in, his, in uh, his input as well. And then hopefully by then we'll be in a position to bring back to council a path forward, a recommendation for a path forward on how we want to have this discussion moving forward. Um, we do, uh, we have provided the report to each of them, along with we were able to obtain a copy of uh, the Lincoln study. And so Ms. Hammond will send those to that to you as well. Um, but we want you to know that we are moving forward and we think that hopefully within uh, the next month or so we, we can have a recommendation for council to consider. For referrals. Thank you, Ms. Devine. Are you all, did you all have any other reports or referrals? I think that's it. I think we're, we're probably ready to go. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, any, any citizen um, uh, in the queue for public input? No, sir, not at this time. All right, Mr. Duval. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to SC Code 30-4-70A2, COVID-19 redistricting, uh, quiet zone, uh, bond court proceedings. Uh, discussion of matters related to proposed location or, exp or expansion of services to encourage location or expansion of industries or other businesses pursuant to SC code 30-4-70A2 affordable housing projects. A discussion of negotiations in essence to propose contractual arrangements pursuant to 30-4-70A2 Owensville park and stormwater fees. 
uh, receipt of legal advice related to a pending threat and a potential claim pursuant to SC Code 30-4-70A2, former council member, and discussion regarding the development of security personnel or devices pursuant to SC Code 30-4-70A3, Nehemiah Action Assembly. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Saying none, then with the previous question, Kurt Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Mr. McDowell? Yeah, mute Ed. I'm sorry, yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. 